A prize worth over £20,000. Text prize to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob rees and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 12 o'clock on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. Rishi Sunak has leapt to the defence of J.K. Rowling after she dared the Scottish police to arrest her over her views on transgender issues. Could J.K. Rowling actually find herself behind bars under Humza Yusuf's new hate crime laws? Total woke nonsense. That's Nigel Farage slamming the Team GB diverse rebrand of the Union flag ahead of this summer's Olympics. But designers claim they're simply refreshing the colour palette. And Hugh Edwards is expected to be named the BBC's highest paid newsreader despite being off air for eight months following his suspension over a sex pick scandal. BBC bosses brace for backlash. Calls mount for a Ukraine-style visa scheme for Palestinians. 60 organisations are now calling on the Home Secretary to set up a special route. But should Britain open its arms? Now, we've had a special visa route for Ukrainians. We've had a special visa route for people from Hong Kong. We've even had special routes from people from Afghanistan. But the question is, should yet another route now be set up? for people fleeing from Gaza. Yes, so dozens of organisations are essentially hoping to ramp up the pressure on the Home Secretary specifically. They're all signing a letter, they're sending it to the Home Secretary saying, we need a Ukraine-style visa scheme for Palestinians trapped in Gaza. Now they're talking about a type of special route visa so that Palestinians can be reunited with family, um, extended family who may be in the United Kingdom. The details are still a little vague on what exactly they're hoping for, but we've got the First Minister in Scotland saying he'd love Scotland to open its arms. So could the UK do the same? Mm, we want your views on the matter. Should we? Or have we done enough for many parts of the world? GB views at GB News. Dot com. Really interested to read your thoughts, and we'll be getting to those a little bit later in the programme, along with a roster of other stories. But before all of that, it's your headlines with Sam Francis.
Tom and Emily, thank you very much. The headlines at 12 o'clock. Lord David Cameron says Israel must explain how seven aid workers, including a British citizen, were killed in an airstrike in Gaza. The group were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the World Central Kitchen logo. That NGO has claimed the Israel Defence Forces carried out the attack despite coordinating their movements with the military. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says there must now be a transparent investigation. Shocked and saddened to hear the reported deaths of aid workers in Gaza. We're urgently working to confirm all the details, but my thoughts right now with their friends and family, they're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised uh, and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered, and it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that, and we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently, because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. Next to an update on developments in Finland this afternoon where a 12-year-old child has been killed. Two other children of the same age are in a serious condition and that's after a shooting carried out by another child at a primary school there. The victims, we understand, have been taken to hospital. While a building at the school premises outside Helsinki was cordoned off, parents, meanwhile, were picking up their children from another building near to the scene at the time of that incident. The permit, the police say, for that handgun belonging to the child uh, belonged to the relative of the suspect. And police say the 12-year-old has admitted the attack during a preliminary interview, but it's not yet clear what motivated the attack. The Finnish Prime Minister has also said that he is deeply shocked uh, and saddened by the incident and that his thoughts are with the victims and their families. Here in the UK, the Prime Minister is backing J.K. Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. It came into effect yesterday and outlaws hatred against people on certain grounds, including age, disability, sexuality and people who are transgender. But the author says the law risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. And Rishi Sunak has backed her concerns, saying that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. Shadow Minister Pat McFadden told GB News this morning that Labour has no plans to introduce any similar new hate crime laws if it wins the next election. We want proper enforcement of the anti-hate crime laws that are there and make sure that the right penalties are in place to protect people. We're not planning to legislate for new crimes in this area and I don't think J.K. Rowling should be arrested. Adidas says that it will block any German football shirts that feature the number 44 amid concerns over a resemblance to the SS Nazi symbol. The new kits were launched last month ahead of Germany hosting the European Championships in June and July. But a historian has flagged similarities with the logo for SS, which was a Nazi paramilitary organisation. The country's football association says it didn't spot the similarities when the design was approved, but it will now be changed. Prices in shops are rising at the slowest rate for two years. That's according to new figures. In March, shop prices were up 1.3%, slowing from 2.5% the month before. The British Retail Consortium says that discounts on popular Easter treats and essentials, along with promotions on electricals and clothing, have helped to keep prices down. Economic advisor Vicky Price told GB News that prices have actually been coming down for some time, but it's not been reflected on the shelves. Costs are still reasonably high for supermarkets. They had to pay a lot more in terms of wages, um, still some transport costs and so on. Uh, but overall, I think we could have expected by now to see prices falling rather than just inflation falling. And that is something which I think we need to be looking at for the future as well. And the cost of a postage stamp is going up from today as Royal Mail moves to address a drop in demand. The first class stamps will set you back £1.35 each. That's a rise of 10 pence. And it's the same increase for second-class stamps, which now cost 85 pence. Just 12 months ago, a first-class stamp cost 95 pence. It's the fourth price rise in just two years and comes after a warning that lower demand for postage is pushing up costs for Royal Mail. That's the latest from the newsroom. More in half an hour. You can, of course, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Now, though, it's back to Tom and Emily.
Good afternoon, Britain. It's seven minutes past twelve. And leading the show today, J.K. Rowling has challenged the police to arrest her under Scotland's new hate crime laws, which took effect yesterday, creating a new offence, stirring up hatred against protected characteristics. But, as the author highlights, they offer women no additional protections. Yes, so Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, he has subsequently backed... J.K. Rowling saying his party, the Conservative Party, will always protect free speech. Well, joining us now from Glasgow is our Scotland reporter Tony Maguire, who's been out and about speaking to the people of Scotland on this issue. And Tony, what's the reaction? Good afternoon, Will. Certainly yesterday the, the anger and vitriol that we saw kind of poured out uh, that people's um, free speech rights were getting taken away from them has sort of given way to to the, the deeper questions of, of confusion. You know, what can I say? What can't I say? Where can I can I speak my mind? Because, you know, the bill, as we have discussed at length on the channel, um, the, the new legislation can reach right into people's homes. So fiery debates around the dinner table, down the pub, or certainly in the workplace, well, they can all be subject to a police investigation. Now, Police Scotland, they are among the, the most, um, I guess, showing trepidation uh, towards the new legislation. They're concerned that it's going to turn the public against them, and it's also going to put their already stressed officers under even more stress and strain. Now, yesterday, outside the Parliament, lots of groups joined together. There was even an ALBA um, um, an, a member from ALBA. There was a family party, various pastors, and, of course, the Glasgow Cabbie. And one of the groups that were there were called the Together Association. Now, you might be familiar with Alan Miller. He was speaking to Nigel last night, believe it or not. But given today's news about Rishi Sunak showing um, his support for free speech and defence of free speech, I asked him about how much this meant to the greater conversation up here in Scotland. It's good that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has come out and said that he's against it and that it's a problem. We should remember that's the same Prime Minister and the government that have, that have implemented the Online Safety Act, which has all sorts of controls and measures in terms of things that are said online. Uh, but at the same time, they've got a slightly contradictory set of policies because they have also argued for free speech and the universities and elsewhere Anyone that's coming out and challenging this uh, is important. That's why it was so good at the rally, where you saw people who were unionists and Republicans, people that were pastors and religious, people that were secular, people from very different political backgrounds, all recognising that uh, we have a common interest and a common purpose in challenging this attack on us together. And that's what we encourage with everyone. Now, certainly, we can't really end this segment without talking about J.K. Rowling. She posted that massive 11-part message on X last night, calling out some of Scotland's highest-profile um, transition women. Now, she obviously gave the come-on to police Scotland to arrest her when she arrives back in country, but it's likely that's not going to happen. Certainly, speech and various characteristics of this discourse are still protected, and unless somebody's life or feel for their life or their safety, um, it's likely to go under the radar of the police. Thank you very much indeed, Tony Maguire, our Scotland reporter there in Glasgow. But uh, joining us now to discuss this a little bit further is the political commentator and former SNP member Stuart Crawford. Uh, Stuart, could the First Minister, Humza Yusuf, find himself in a very public battle with J.K. Rowling? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes, I, I think that's very much uh, might be the case. Um, th I mean, from my my personal view is thank goodness we have someone like J.K. Rowling, who's got the profile and the means to take on what is yet another example of loony legislation being passed through the Scottish Parliament, supported by all parties. It has to be said. So we can't just lay this at the door at Humza, of Hamza Yusuf and the SNP. But it's another egregious example of bad law in a long series of bad legislation that has been passed. Mm. And I think that uh, uh, Rishi Sunak will be, could well be, end up being em embarrassed by J.K. Rowling, because as Tony has just said, I think it's highly unlikely the police are going to arrest her for her views.
Stuart, it's, it's right that you pick up it wasn't just the SNP that voted for this. I've been looking at the, the numbers, the vote breakdown. It actually passed way back in 2021, only came into effect yesterday. 82 members of the Scottish Parliament voted in favour of this bill and 32 voted against it. Now, that 82 included the SNP, the Lib Dems, the Labour Party and the Scottish Greens. The majority of those who opposed it were the Scottish Conservative Party. Stuart, I know that you're a former member of the SNP and I, I just wonder, is it issues like this that made you resign your membership? Well, yes, I think so. I mean, th th there's no common sense in, in this latest piece of uh, legislation. And I'm a great believer of applying common sense to all situations to try and come up with a reasonable solution. Uh, the uh, SNP, like many uh, political parties, including in Westminster, seems to have been captured by, by a small but very vociferous group of single issue uh, fanatics, if you want to call them that, mm. um, and uh, listen to them uh, mainly because of fear of offending and of fear of what that would bring uh, to them. And it's this lack of robustness and the, uh, the group think that I think, think is very disappointing uh, in the Scottish Parliament and no doubt in Westminster as well. Yes, one concern following on from Tom's uh, question there and your, and your answer. A lot of concern coming in through our inbox from our viewers and listeners saying, could this type of legislation come to the rest of the United Kingdom? Because, of course, there will be many members of the Labour Parliamentary Party who support this stuff. Well, I mean, it's, it's hardly for me living up in Scotland to comment on legislation that might be brought in to affect the rest of the UK. Uh, but I would say that it would be a great pity if that was the case, because I think this is bad law. And it shows once again that the one thing above all else that the Scottish Parliament lacks is a revising cha chamber. Uh, we have no House of Lords or House of Lairds up here, uh, which might weed out some of the nonsense that's been passed through over the past few years. House of Lairds sounds amazing. That would be brilliant. Perhaps we could use the old chamber of the Scottish Parliament, because, of course, it was originally in um, what was the, the, the City Hall in Edinburgh, I believe. It was an ornate um, sort of wood-lined room, and, and now you've got this sort of thing that looks a bit like a, a secondary school assembly hall that is the Scottish Parliament, which is a bit of a shame, architecturally speaking. Um, but, Stuart, I, I, I wonder what the political ramifications of this could be, because uh, potentially not everyone is going to be thinking this is a law that will affect me, but they might think this is a law that could affect someone I know, that has a chilling effect on what people can say and what people can think. And perhaps more than that in electoral terms, we are living through a cost of living crisis in all four corners of the United Kingdom. People are seeing real sque squeezes on their living standards. There's a migration crisis at the border uh, across the English Channel. There are huge issues huge political issues in this age. And what the Scottish Parliament seems to be focusing on is what you can say or not say about LGBT rights. Yes, well, that's indicative of, of the uh, competence or lack of competence uh, of the members of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, with this, they've gone with, with something which they can all uh, understand, if you like, but it's not, a it's not one of the difficult problems like the economy or the education or the National Health Service or the fact that mm. we're unable to build two ferries on the Clyde where we used to build half the world's merchant marine. Uh, something is far wrong in Scotland at the moment and this sort of stuff is not going to help at all. I mean, the, the legislation is so uh, encompassing, stirring up hatred. What does that mean? Where's the definition of that? Insulting behaviour. I mean, every football match in Scotland will come to a, come to a halt if that's the sort of stuff that's going to be uh, regimented. Yes, and of course it will all depend on what the police choose to focus their time on. And so many have warned, essentially, that this will waste huge amounts of resources on top of everything else. But thank you very much, Stuart Crawford. Great to get your view on all of this, political commentator and former SNP member. I think, for me, I can see this legislation being brought to the rest of the United Kingdom. Yep. Yep. I would like to see a very, very public battle between J.K. Rowling and Humza Yusuf because I believe very strongly that J.K. Rowling is more popular, by and large, than Humza well, Yusuf. I think that's a fair point to I say. I think that's fair to say. And I think she would take this to the end. She's got the resources, she's got the fame, uh, the money, the time, perhaps, 
to really go with this. She clearly feels passionately she, about it. Almost setting herself up as a martyr mm. in this case. Yeah. Um, it would be extraordinary, would it not, to see police turn up at her house, take her in for questioning, all, all because she said some things on Twitter where... But maybe something like that has to happen to be some kind of watershed moment where things actually change and people realise that this type of legislation is chilling. It's not just harmless, progressive, let's be all nice to each other, mm. hatred is harm and, you know, what the SM silence is what violence the SMP and all this. What the say, though, and they're right in this, this isn't something entirely new no. in our law. There's something called Section uh, 127 of the, uh, of the Malicious Communications Act, which does mean that if you say something that is um, malicious in a message, uh, you can be spoken to by the police. And there are examples of people who've made bad jokes on Twitter... Absolutely. ..who have had suspended sentences handing out to them. There was the, uh, someone, I believe, in Scotland who made a joke about uh, Captain Tom Moore. Now, he was handed... Uh, a pretty uh, hefty investigation from the police. There's another chap who made their dog do a Hitler salute. That's right. He and got again, it done. He got... He, he got uh, we don't have free speech. We don't have free speech, but, but I believe that this law makes it worse. Indeed. It, it accentuates some of the problems already in the system and, the, and, the, and, and, and it opens up that question. Should we be pushing back against this stuff? Because there are so many examples of what in many other countries would be considered legal if offensive speech uh, now being treated as a criminal justice issue in the United Kingdom. Yes, well, coming up, let us know what you make of all that, by the way, but coming up, 60 charities and organisations have now signed a letter calling on the Home Office to create a Ukraine-style visa scheme for Palestinians. Is this the right move? Should Britain open its arms to people trapped in Gaza? This is Good Afternoon Britain. We're on GB News. I'm Patrick Christie's. This is GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Serving police officers, showing that up to 20% of them are thinking about quitting the force and doing so within the next year or two. What on earth is going wrong? The problem, of course, is that those that go will be the experienced ones to be replaced by inexperienced ones. Kevin Hurley, former Detective Chief Superintendent at the Met Police, joins me from his home in Surrey. Kevin, this figure is shocking. The terms and conditions have really dropped off under Theresa May's what I would describe as an attack on the police service, where their pay has really dropped off, spending power down about 22% on what it once was. Worse still, the golden handcuffs, which were once the excellent police pension, have been taken away and the pension is now much reduced. The other mm. thing that's killing them is the constant media and activist battering for police officers. Off the back of that one psychopath and the, uh, the other if you like, Tinder rapists, everybody now thinks the police are kind of all like that. What that means for the individual patrol officers, they're being given stick everywhere. For example, you know, their bosses left, right and centre are rolling over. Oh, yes, we're institutionally racist. What that means for a 25-year-old constable working in Ballam High Street is everyone screaming at him, you're a racist pig. They get surrounded on the streets when they try and do a stop and search on arrest. Add to that the fact that the criminal justice system is collapsing, they're tipping out the prisons with early releases, So, because, of course, there's no prison space. Cases are taking years to get to court. They're getting derisory offences, sentences, because there's no room in the prisons. All of that's really demoralising for the police. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. 
There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Emily Carver. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 22 minutes past 12. Now, an aid worker from Britain is amongst seven people killed in an airstrike in Gaza. Yes, the unnamed victim so far was travelling with colleagues in armoured cars and had informed the Israel Defence Force of their planned movements. Israel says they will investigate, um, but let's get some of the detail with our Home and Security Editor, Mark White. Um, Mark, what do we, what do we know? Well, this incident happened yesterday evening. The convoy of vehicles from the World Central Kitchen, WCK, uh, had apparently cleared this with Israeli authorities to run a route uh, on the Al Rashid coastal highway uh, in central Gaza, having picked up about 100 tonnes of aid from a ship that had come from Cyprus. And increasingly, uh, this particular aid charity has been working in and around Gaza. Uh, but at some point yesterday evening, uh, that convoy was struck and we know that seven aid workers have been killed. Now, we're told that at least one UK national has been killed, although the uh, Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, when he was speaking earlier, spoke about UK nationals, plural. So we'll just wait till uh, we get more information on that. But other nationalities uh, involved are Australian, uh, Polish, dual nationals uh, from the US and Canada as well. Now, of course, uh, every single day there are many people uh, who lose their lives in Gaza. Uh, but any time that it involves citizens from other countries, then understandably it gathers international attention. It has done uh, on this particular uh, occasion. But actually working as an aid worker in Gaza anyway is very dangerous, the most dangerous assignment in the world, we're told. Uh, today's uh, latest tally of uh, deaths in Gaza take the number of aid workers who've been killed uh, in that area to more than 200 since this war began. And it will be doubly difficult for Israel, I think. Um, it's carrying out an urgent review of what happened. It's not come out and denied it outright, which indicates it may well have been uh, an Israeli missile strike of some sort that was involved here. But it will be uh, embarrassing for Israel, not just because of the mistake, if that's what happened at mm -hmm. the end of the day, but also because of this particular aid charity. Israel has been championing uh, this aid charity. They're very anti uh, UNRWA, the United Nations uh, charity uh, mm -hmm. that's working uh, out of uh, Gaza at the moment. They claim that UNRWA have um, employed some 2,000 members of Hamas. Um, mm. So Israel has very significant problems with this United Nations aid agency and therefore has been trying to uh, get other charities in there and working, and one of them was this charity, WCK. But now with what has happened here, uh, this charity has suspended, for the time being at least, all operations in Gaza. And it seems like it could have been a grave mistake indeed. But uh, Mark White, thank you very much for bringing us that uh, update there. And of course, there are questions now with regard to what is going on in what is undoubtedly one of the most dangerous corners of the world. Is it time, therefore, for the United Kingdom to support Gazan families evacuating? Yes. Could schemes such as Homes for Ukraine be emulated? Well, that's what 60 charities and organisations are calling for. They've signed a letter calling on the Home Office to create such a scheme, a Ukraine-style visa for Palestinians. Now, the letter signed by the Refugee Council and Care for Calais and law firms and other organisations has called on the government to reunite families and provide special routes to safety in this country.
Well, joining us now is the director of the Sanctuary Foundation, Dr. Krish Kandir, and uh, he played a vital role in setting up the Ukrainian scheme. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I suppose, on the one hand, uh, there have been a number of schemes. There have been over 100,000 people who came in the very successful Ukrainian scheme. The Hong Kong scheme delivered over 100, almost 200,000 people coming across on that. We've had tens of thousands from Afghanistan as well. I suppose the, the, the question becomes, is there a limited amount of uh, capacity when it comes to taking refugees from various war zones around the world? Thanks, Tom. The, the UK has been incredibly generous. As you say, over 200,000 Ukrainians have come to the UK, most of whom have been put into people's homes. The British public have been incredibly hospitable. What this letter is asking for it is similar to the Families for Ukraine scheme, which was Ukrainian families in the UK already offering hospitality to their family members. And we know there are many Palestinian families that would like to do that. Let me give you one example. Dr. Yusuf is a consultant radiologist in Liverpool. He has a nephew in Gaza, actually very close to the region where this terrible attack happened yesterday that's left a British aid worker dead. Um, this little boy, he's 13 years old, he's lost his entire family, his mum, his dad, his brothers and sisters. This uncle is his only surviving relative. He's desperate to bring this little boy here to the UK and look after him. He wants to cover the costs. There's money to support that. The main issue is the visa, and I think that's what this letter mm. is asking. That's completely, un that's completely understandable in, in that case, of course, that someone would want to be reunited with a family member who's trapped in Gaza, as Tom said, one of the most dangerous places in the world at the moment. But I've got to be honest with you, the vast majority of people getting in touch with us on this topic are saying, hang on a minute, how can we possibly know whether there are terrorist sympathisers who might use the route? This is one of the most dangerous terror hotspots in the world. What about national security? And also lots of people getting in touch saying, you know, we've done our bit. Can't we, can't other, you know, can't Arab states, for example, take in Palestinians? Similar cultures take in Palestinians? You know, why does it call on Britain to do so? In most refugee resettlements, the, the regional, the local region is the place that most people go. We're talking about a small number of people who have family here in the UK. And as you say, family is where you'd want to be if you'd experienced such trauma. There's such a terrible catastrophe going on. Krish, is it, is it, sorry to interrupt you, is it a small number? Do we have an idea of how many people could potentially um, apply for such a scheme if it were to exist? Well, we've been trying to get a very small number, just five children, again, lost their entire families. They have traumatic injuries and we have hospitals willing to take them. And so far, there's been no willingness from the Home Office. We can set the, the boundaries here. It's, up to, it's in our gift to decide how many people will come. I think we just need to say we're a first world country, we're a strong economy, we need to play our part alongside regional responses. Uh, the, the case study you raise is a really interesting one. I think it's one that very few people could disagree with, where uh, this is a fully funded place, someone wants to take in a direct family member, a child. Uh, all of these things seem to tick almost every box. Uh, I suppose the question becomes, are those the necessary boxes, i.e., does this, should this in every case be a funded situation, not through the taxpayer, but through the family? Uh, and it, should it only apply to children? I don't think those are the uh, fundamental criteria. I think we're making it almost impossible, politically impossible, to oppose this. It's children. They haven't been involved in any terrorist activity. We can definitely vet these children. We're covering the cost, so it's not a financial burden on the government. But even then, there's no openness. And I think that's where things become morally difficult. How can we say no under these circumstances? Yes, I think the issue of vetting is... Um... Well, it's definitely there and lots of people getting in touch concerned about that issue. But thank you very much. Really interesting to speak to you. Dr. Krish Kandia, who is the director of the Sanctuary Foundation, and he played a, a vital role in setting up the Ukrainian scheme. No, I, think, I think he makes a really fair point. And for those five children that seem to be funded and its direct family members, that would, it seems bizarre that that's stopping. I think the concern for many people... Hang on, hang on, people, though, Tom, hang on. I think the concern for many people would be, where does it stop? Is it just those five? And at what point does this place obligations on our health service and on housing rather than just 
But also culturally, elements. we've got a massive problem with anti-Semitism in this country. Could we potentially be adding to that? Uh, we've seen, we know how children, unfortunately, can be indoctrinated with this stuff in Gaza. Do we really want to be importing more of that um, potential hatred into this country? Of course, the risk that there's terrorist sympathisers along using the visa route. But yes, in the case of these individuals, but that's the problem mm. with this type of policy, isn't it? Because you can Doesn't always find... You can always find cases where it would seem evil not to allow it to take place, but you've got to draw a line somewhere. I would suggest that helping humanitarily in the region would be the more sensible thing to do. But um, welcome all views, GB views at gbnews.com. Let us know what you make of it. We'll get to some of your views on this, actually, because you've got lots of, lots of opinions. Mm, absolutely. The inbox seems to be hotting up. But coming up, reports suggest that a plan has been launched to install a Liz Truss-style Tory leader. But in what way and by whom? More on that after your headlines with Sam. Very good afternoon from the GB newsrooms. Just gone half past 12. Uh, look at the headlines this hour. The Prime Minister says Israel must now explain how seven aid workers, including a British citizen, were killed in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. The group were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the World Central Kitchen logo. That NGO has claimed the Israeli Defence Forces carried out the attack despite coordinating their movements with the military. Those killed also include Palestinians and people from Australia, from Poland and the US. Well, speaking in the last hour or so, Rishi Sunak said there must now be a transparent investigation. Shocked and saddened to hear the reported deaths of aid workers in Gaza. We're urgently working to confirm all the details, but my thoughts right now with their friends and family, they're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered, and it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that, and we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently, because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. A 12-year-old child has been killed and two other children are in a serious condition after a shooting carried out by another child of the same age at a primary school in Finland. We understand that the permit for the handgun used in the, in the incident belonged to a relative of the suspect. Police say the 12-year-old has admitted to carrying out the shooting, but the circumstances are not yet clear. The Finnish Prime Minister says he is deeply shocked and saddened and that his thoughts are with the victims and their families. In the UK, the Prime Minister is backing J.K. Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. It came into effect yesterday and bans hatred against people on certain grounds. But the author says it risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. Rishi Sunak has backed her concerns, saying that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For exclusive, limited edition and rare gold coins that are always newsworthy, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a look at the markets this afternoon. The pound will buy you $1.2565 and €1.1693. The price of gold is currently £1,798.54 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,978 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. The latest GB News travel. The anti-clockwise side of the M60 is queuing to an earlier accident that's now on the hard shoulder at 14 through to junction 13 for Worsley. Delays are to 17 even though all lanes have reopened. On the southbound side of the M6, a lane closure on the exit slip road to junction 29 for Lockstock Hall. That's to a broken down vehicle and traffic is coping well. Slow though for the southbound side of the M1. Long delays to an earlier accident at 11A for Dunstable and Luton north through to junction 11 delays at a flitic at junction 12 there's also ongoing roadworks adding to the time travel and the eastbound side of the m4 has the lane closure on the exit slip road at junction 33 for cardiff western services to a broken down lorry that's the very latest
You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Nana Queer, weekends from 3 p.m. I like to call this one robbing Peter to pay Paul. The Labour Party have embarked on a journey that I can only describe as politics of envy. I think it's time we scrutinise their policies more closely and establish in our minds what a Labour government might mean to the education system. Sir Keir Starmer and his party have for far too long capitalised on the abject failure of the Conservatives and haven't really had to explain themselves. But as part of their manifesto, Labour intend to charge VAT at 20% on private schools because I suspect they think that people who send their kids there will stump up the cash no matter what and that these people have money. They will then use this money, Labour, to fund state schools. Basically, they will rob Peter to pay Paul. But what I believe they've failed to realise, and I'm not sure whether they've factored this in, is that many people who send their kids to private schools do so at great sacrifice and are, in fact, paying twice into the education system. I spent my first year of secondary education in a state school. I'll be honest, when I started, I was at the top of the class. But by the end of the year, I was near the bottom. But then my dad got promoted to a post on Wall Street in the States. My parents sent me to a private boarding school in the UK run by nuns, and my family moved to America. Thank God for the opportunity I was given to go private. At boarding school, I grew in confidence, and I'm here now because of it. My father's work, Nat West, and a loan my dad took out paid for my private education. We were nowhere near as rich as some of the kids there, but... There are also many children, I would say at least half, whose parents were busting a gut to send them there. It is clear that the state education system is failing. But rather than robbing Peter to pay Paul, surely it would be better for the party to improve the state system without destroying the private sector. Right, it's 12.39, you're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain and you've been getting in touch over the suggestion that there should be some kind of Ukraine-style visa scheme for Palestinians yeah. caught up in Gaza. And I have to say there's been a fairly high degree of unanimity in the inbox because uh, a lot of people are bringing up the same theme. Uh, Encapsulated by Alistair, for example, who says, there's a reason why Egypt has closed borders to them. Listen to the neighbours who know the situation. Um, yes, Neil says, why don't rich Arab countries neighbouring Gaza offer to take in the Palestinians? Why is it always non-Arab countries that are asked? And Chris says, hi, I think until the rest of the Arab nations take Palestinians in, then we should not. And Jo's written in, she says she's angry with what I said about anti-Semitism. She says that's cruel ignorance. And how would I feel if my whole family was blown to pieces? Um, and she goes on to call that comment repulsive. The, prob the problem is there's quite a lot of evidence to, to suggest that, that children in Gaza do receive indoctrination through their schooling about hating Jews. That's just, you know, evidence. Look yeah. it up. That's not to say that the people in Gaza are not going through the most horrendous experience at the moment and we should be giving humanitarian aid. We should be helping but we have people to remember with support. But that Hamas runs the government. Hamas runs the schools. Hamas is deciding what these children are taught. I've seen examples, I've seen videos of sort of school productions, school plays put on, mm. where it's all about killing Jews. I, th this, is, this isn't fantasy, this is what's, what's going on, and I, I suppose it's one of the reasons why it's such a, a fraught conflict yeah. in that part of the world, and it's just desperately, desperately sad. And I suppose the question is, can people be unbrainwashed? Because I think it's fair to say a significant degree of, of the number of people living in uh, Gaza have sadly been brainwashed by the schooling that they've received. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they're, they're instinctively bad people. It means that Hamas is an evil organisation that has been trying to brainwash children. There. And, of course, there are people within Gaza, living in Gaza, who detest Hamas. Yes. Uh, and wish that Gaza was not being run by well, such course, an organisation. Of course, they banned elections. They got elected in 2006 mm. and then banned elections taking place afterwards, which suggests they think that, um, well, I mean, if they, if they really believed that everyone supported absolutely everything they did, they'd hold elections, but they don't want to. Well, quite. But keep your views coming in, gbviews at gbnews.com. But we're going to move on because reports suggest a plan 
has been launched to install a Liz Truss style Tory leader by the popular conservatism group. Funny that. Yes, the Popcons are a movement aiming to restore democratic accountability and deliver popular conservative policies. Well, they've reportedly devised a plan to introduce a future Tory leader who's aligned with the economic views of Liz Truss. Now, I'm sure this will make a lot of people scoff considering Liz Truss's very short tenure, but could, would you like to see a bit of a revival of libertarian, mm. free market, economics? She tried it out. Well, or did she? Or Was, did she she? Because, Was she allowed to? Was she allowed to? Because at the same time that she, yes, tried to cut taxes, she also introduced a huge amount of extra spending. Lots of money. With the, with the energy price guarantee mm. um, and, and it, I always find it slightly uncomfortable when people say well this was a, a libertarian experiment like, what libertarian experiment tries to spend almost 200 billion pounds on fixing energy prices that's the opposite of libertarian yes a bit, of a, that, so that's, that's bit it. of a socialist spending and libertarian taxes I don't know anyway <laughs> joining us now is GB News political correspondent Catherine Forster who's going to bring us the detail on all of this um, Catherine I, I suppose this isn't a surprise coming from the popular conservative of which Liz Truss is a, is a prime member, if not the leader of it all. Yes, she's not the leader for obvious reasons. And even Liz, Liz Truss, who's not particularly troubled by self-doubt, I think it's fair to say, is not suggesting for a moment that she should run again for Conservative leader after her brief seven-week tenure as Prime Minister. But Mark Littlewood, who uh, was formerly the director of the Institute for Economic Affairs, this right-leaning, libertarian, free-market think tank, um, have been plotting, apparently, for what happens after the next election. Bear in mind, of course, it hasn't happened yet. It might not happen for months. But they're working on the assumption the Conservatives are going to lose it and lose it badly. So Mark Littlewood has come up with this uh, strategy, apparently, uh, 70, 70,000. And it's based on getting the support of 70,000 Conservative members and... Um, 70 Conservative MPs for their proposed candidate to take forward sort of libertarian, uh, conservative policies, if you like. I think, interesting, the 70 MP figure, because that implies potentially that they are only thinking that the Conservatives might be left with sort of 140 seats after the next election. Bear in mind, they've got way over 350 Currently, and actually, even 140 uh, would be good going if you believe that um, quite shocking MRP poll from Salvation that came out at the weekend of 15,000 people. They predicted, if an election was held now, that the Conservatives would only be left with 98 seats. And if they did some sort of deal with the Reform Party, who, of course, are snapping at their heels on the right, um, they could potentially save only around 150 seats. So they haven't fought the next election. They haven't lost the next election. But clearly, many of them assume it is already gone and are plotting quite noisily behind the scenes. Well, the first rule in politics, of course, it's often said, learn to count. And it does seem that that's what uh, the popular conservatism group is doing, although um, perhaps in a slightly pessimistic, although some might say realistic way. Catherine Forster, thank you very much for bringing us all of that. Yes, uh, a Liz Truss-style leader. Could that be the future? For the well, Conservative people, Party, people it will say, be a fraught fight. I, I mean, people forget Liz Truss did win the leadership yeah, election. Yeah, she did. Uh, and I think everyone can agree the way in which the policies were implemented and, and perhaps fought against by elements of the um, economic establishment uh, was not the best way in which they could have been delivered. But were some fundamental ideas that she had perhaps the right solution at the wrong time. Albie Amancona, who's often on this channel, presents a show on Saturday. He says, the policies were right, but they were in the wrong cadence, he says. The wrong cadence. What a lovely wrong turn cadence. of phrase. There you go. That's his view yeah. anyway. But coming up, Hugh Edwards. Now he's expected to be named the BBC's highest paid newsreader, despite being off air for eight months. Could the BBC face a bit of a backlash over this? Welcome along to your latest weather update from the Met Office. 
for GB News. For many, it's a fine looking day out there today, dry and bright. Many of us seeing some pleasantly warm, sunny spells, but there is some rain in the southwest from this area of low pressure and across the far northeast, northeast of Scotland, under this weather front sink, persistent rain across Aberdeenshire, cold wind blowing across Shetland as well. The breeze picking up in the southwest as the rain creeps in across Devon, Cornwall, parts of Somerset, and just getting into South Wales by the end of the afternoon. One or two showers in southern Scotland, maybe northwest England, but for large parts of England, Wales, Northern Ireland, it's a fine, bright afternoon and quite warm in the sunny spells, 15, 16. Feeling cold, though, with that wet weather lingering across uh, the northeast of Scotland. That uh, rain persists through much of the night and further south, the rain will spread north. So most of us will see some wet weather through the course of the night, some heavier bursts likely in parts of North Wales, northwest England. It's going to be pretty soggy too across the east and south of Northern Ireland. Temperatures mostly holding up in the single figures, 9, 10 degrees the low in parts of the south. But it's a soggy start to Wednesday for Northern England, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Uh, further rain and hill snow to come across the Grampians. Something a little drier in western Scotland and brighter conditions here. And it'll brighten up quite nicely too over the Midlands, South Wales and southern England. Some decent spells of sunshine through tomorrow afternoon, which could see temperatures getting up to 15, 16, maybe 17 Celsius. Well, I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's coming up to 10 minutes to one, and Hugh Edwards is set to be announced as the BBC's most expensive newsreader, despite not reading any news. Yes, he was suspended last year. Yes, the long-serving presenter was, of course, embroiled in controversy over alleged nude images were sent to a younger man. Uh, was sent to a younger person. He's yet to return to our screens, having to be hospitalised with serious mental health issues. So why is the sidelined presenter still costing the licence fee payer more than £400,000 a year? Yes, some questions here. Uh, why don't we get to our guest? Joining us is the former BBC News producer, David Keeley. Um, and David, um, we don't know all the details in what has gone on here. Of course, a lot of this is very obscure and is, is full of rumour and hearsay. But what we do know is that Hugh Edwards uh, allegedly paid around £35,000 for uh, intimate images of a young adult. Now, there's nothing illegal that has been suggested here, but it was deemed to be inappropriate. In any case, perhaps the bigger inappropriateness is that this is a man expected to be the highest paid newsreader for not reading any news. Indeed. And um, uh, the licence fee payer is entitled to know more than they do at the moment, I think, is the bottom line here. This, uh, uh, this affair first started, um, as, as I understand it, last May, when uh, the parents of the young man involved 
um, approach to the BBC in Cardiff. BBC have already admitted that they were very slow to pick this up. It was it was in in July before it came to the full attention of the senior management. Again, as a, as I understand it, but this is just classic BBC. I think they are very good at saying they are going to launch an investigation, but they always do it on their terms, in their own time and in their own way. Now, of course, there's got due process has got to be followed here. Um, there are employment laws. Uh, I don't know what Hugh Edwards' contract was. But at the bottom line, it comes down to what I said at the beginning. The license fee payer, um, learning that somebody has been off air now for the, all these months and is likely to be paid nearly um, half a million pounds for his services, but hasn't been on air, um, just needs to know what's gone on here. Yes, and um, by the, by the what, 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 uh, sorry, by the sounds of it, from reports today, there's lots of people inside the BBC who are, well, irritated, let's say, about the amount of money that Hugh Edwards is still being paid. Yes, and I'm not. I'm not surprised. For those of them, m most people don't uh, working at the BBC. They they are very well paid, but they're not paid anywhere near what Hugh Edwards is is paid. They're they're labouring away um, uh, uh, all the while, and and knowing that one of their colleagues, who clearly um, is 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 under serious investigation, is, is earning this money, must be very demoralising. Uh, is there any um, sort of means of recourse here? I mean, what, what can happen uh, in a situation like this? There will be uh, thousands of people paying licence fees solely to go towards funding someone who is not currently doing the job they're paid to do. I, I, I mean, I, I, how long can this situation realistically go on for? Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. And, and of course, as I said, the BBC, this is how they seem to manage their problems these days. Um, there, 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 there is a, an urgent need, I think, to look at the licence fee. Some of that, is, uh, the, there are elements being looked at, as Tim Davey made a speech, the Director General made a speech last week. But again, it's being done in the BBC's own way, in its own time. and. Long-suffering licence fee payers must be just wringing their hands and shaking their heads with astonishment that this is is taking so long, and he is being paid this amount of money while while he's not working. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, David Cady. Great to speak to you, former BBC News producer. Now we should clarify that these allegations are about a young person. We don't know uh, more details than that. And uh, all of the details do seem a little bit obscure. That's one of the big problems with the whole case. Yes, it is indeed. Now, we've got much more coming up on the show, including J.K. Rowling daring the Scottish police to arrest her. We'll uh, see what happens there. This is Good Afternoon Britain. We're on GB News. Brighter Outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Across some central southern parts, there will be a bit of sunshine tomorrow, but otherwise it's looking pretty wet and there's some rain to come tonight as well. That's because we have an area of low pressure to the southwest of us and that is driving a feature northwards as we go through the rest of today. So ending the day across parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England on a mostly dry note, but rain in the southwest will feed its way across much of England, Wales and into Northern Ireland overnight with some persistent rain continuing across eastern parts of Scotland, bringing a bit of hill snow over the higher ground here. Temperatures not dropping much for many of us because of the unsettled weather, although a touch of frost is possible across the far north of Scotland. Many areas then waking up tomorrow morning to a pretty wet start and staying wet across northern parts with some further, at times, heavy and persistent rain. Further south, though, a drier picture. Yes, there will be a few showers around, but we should also see some bright or sunny spells develop. In any sunshine, feeling pleasantly warm, highs of around 16 Celsius, but colder further north and feeling it in the wet and the windy weather here. 
Later on, as we go through tomorrow afternoon into the evening, a swathe of more persistent rain is going to affect parts of Devon, Cornwall and into South Wales as well. Looking ahead through the rest of the week and the unsettled picture does remain. In fact, it is likely to turn very windy by the end of the week, but temperatures rising could get to 20 Celsius by Saturday. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsor you could win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's one o'clock on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. Rishi Sunak has leapt to the fence of JK Rowling after she dared the Scottish police to arrest her over her views on transgender issues. Could JK Rowling actually find herself behind bars under U Hamza Youssef's new hate crime laws? It's possible. And total woke nonsense. Nigel Farage slams Team GB's diverse rebrand of the union flag ahead of the Olympics. But designers, they claim they're simply refreshing the colour palette. And Hugh Edwards is expected to be named as the BBC's highest paid newsreader this afternoon, despite being off air for eight months. This follows his suspension over a sex pig scandal. Well, BBC bosses race for backlash. And our debate this hour, should obese people pay a little more to use the National Health Service? Now, there are all sorts of estimates about how much obesity is costing the National Health Service. Some run into the hundreds of billions of pounds. That, over multiple years, of course, the total budget of the NHS is around 180 billion by the end of this funding uh, uh, cycle. But 
The interesting point here is the cost of obesity is no doubt high. Who should bear it? Yes, who should bear it? Apparently, 10 million Britons are feared to be junk food addicts. So is it their fault that they are overweight, let's say? And should they, you know, put a little more money into the NHS coffers if they're costing it so much? But this is, is one estimate. Principle... One estimate is out today that obesity, or at least junk food addiction, mm. is costing the NHS £15 billion a year. Well, I mean, if that's... Could that the, possibly be true? If that's the case, why doesn't the NHS offer the Ozempic fat jab to far more people than are currently able to access it? Isn't it just because they don't have would... enough? No, I don't think it is, because people, lots of people can get it privately. Surely this would save lots and lots of money. But I think, I think there's a fundamental problem here with the way that we're approaching this, which is if you have a national health service that's supposed to sort yeah. of cover everything and it shouldn't sort of police how we live our lives. Um, very few other countries have these sorts of debates whereby, you know, uh, should people be charged in a certain way for a lifestyle choice? Because ultimately the way in which the care of that is funded. Yes, and if you're going to charge people more for being overweight and costing the NHS more through treatment related to their overweightness, what about people who indulge in uh, risky activities? Horse risky riding. sports, horse riding, Bungee skiing, jumping. backflips, gymnastics, whatever can cause you an injury. Or, Smoking, or should smokers pay more for well, the they NHS? they do. Smoking is taxed to the hills. Well, that is true. Should and junk food be taxed more, then? Is that what you're getting at? Absolutely not. <laughs> Firstly, define junk food. Sadiq Khan tried to define junk food on the tube and he ended up banning hummus and hot dogs. Yes, the hot dogs. Um, well, let us know. What do you think? Because I know a lot of people would agree with this, actually, and say, yes, if you're obese, you take responsibility and pay a little more for the NHS. Do you agree with that? Or is that, uh, uh, you know, a type of fat shaming? Let us know. GBVs at GBnews.com. We'll have the debate, but it's your headlines. Tom and Emily, thank you very much and good afternoon from the newsroom. The latest headlines this lunchtime when we start in Israel, where the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, says the killing of seven aid workers in Gaza in what appears to have been an Israeli airstrike was, he says, tragic and unintended. The group, which included a British citizen, were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the World Central Kitchen logo. That NGO has claimed the Israel's defence forces carried out that attack, despite coordinating their movements with the military there. Those killed also include Palestinians and people from Poland and the US. Rishi Sunak says there must now be a transparent investigation. Shocked and saddened to hear the reported deaths of aid workers in Gaza. We're urgently working to confirm all the details, but my thoughts right now with their friends and family, they're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered, and it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that, and we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently, because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. A 12-year-old child has been killed and two other children are in a serious condition after a shooting carried out by another child of the same age at a primary school in Finland. The victims have been taken to hospital while a building at the school outside Helsinki was cordoned off. Parents were picking up their children from another building near to the scene of that shooting at the time of the incident. The permit for the handgun belonged to a relative of the suspect and police say the 12-year-old has admitted to the attack during a preliminary interview, but that it's not yet clear what motivated it. The Finnish Prime Minister says that he is deeply shocked and that his thoughts are with the victims and their families. Here in the UK, the Prime Minister is backing JK Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. It came into effect yesterday and outlaws hatred against people on certain grounds, including age, disability, sexuality and people who are transgender. But the author says that the law risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. Rishi Sunak has backed her concerns and he says that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. Well, Shadow Minister uh, Pat McFadden told GB News this morning that Labour has no plans to introduce new hate crime laws if the party wins the next election. We want proper enforcement of the anti-hate crime laws that are there and make sure that the right penalties 
are in place to protect people. We're not planning to legislate for new crimes in this area. And I don't think J.K. Rowling should be arrested. Adidas says that it will block any German football shirts that feature the number 44 amid concerns over a resemblance to the SS Nazi symbol. The new kits were launched last month ahead of Germany hosting the European Championships later this summer. But a historian has flagged similarities with the logo for SS, which was a Nazi paramilitary organisation. The country's football association says that it didn't spot the similarities when the design was approved and that it will now be changed. Prices in shops are rising at the slowest rate for two years. That's according to new figures. In March, shop prices were up 1.3 per cent, slowing from 2.5 per cent the month before. The British Retail Consortium says that discounts on popular Easter treats and essentials and promotions on electricals and clothing have helped keep prices down. Economic advisor Vicky Price told GB News the prices have actually been coming down for some time, but it's not been reflected on the shelves. Costs are still reasonably high for supermarkets. They had to pay a lot more in terms of wages, um, still some transport costs and so on. Uh, but overall, I think we could have expected by now to see prices falling rather than just inflation falling. And that is something which I think we need to be looking at for the future as well. And the cost of a postage stamp is going up from today as Royal Mail moves to address a drop in demand. A first-class stamp will set you back £1.35. That's a rise of 10 pence. And it's the same increase for second-class stamps, which will now cost 85 pence. Just 12 months ago, a first-class stamp cost 95 pence. And in the fourth price rise in just two years, it comes after warnings that lower demand for postage is pushing up costs for Royal Mail. That's the latest from the newsroom for now. You can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, though, it's back to Tom and Emily. Good afternoon, Britain. It's eight minutes past one. And now the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has leapt to the defence of J.K. Rowling after the author challenged the police to arrest her over new hate crime laws which took effect yesterday. Yeah, she's very much saying, bring it on, if you're tough enough. Now the Prime Minister said the Conservative Party will always protect free speech, adding people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. So it seems like a little battle is going on between Humza Yusuf, the First Minister in Scotland, and Rishi Sunak. But let's speak to the former member of the Scottish Parliament now, Brian Monteith, because, Brian, uh, it's extraordinary to look at the numbers here. When this bill passed in Scotland, which was a couple of years ago, it only took effect yesterday, but a couple of years ago, 82 members of the Scottish Parliament voted in favour of it, and just 32 voted against. Uh, the Conservatives voted against it, but the SNP, the Lib Dems, the Labour Party, the Scottish Green Party all backed this bill, which now J.K. Rowling seems to be taking on in a very public way. Well, that's right, and I think it uh, would be an error to consider that Sunak is simply taking on the First Minister or the Scottish police. Uh, I think he's signalling that uh, Labour's hands are involved in this because Labour uh, voted for this. So he's also taking on Anna Sarwar, the Labour leader in the Scottish Parliament. And that's uh, no doubt to create some sort of wedge issue uh, with Keir Starmer. So I think uh, it's, it's highly political, and I'm sure J.K. Rowling's uh, happy to have the support of the Prime Minister, irrespective of the party, uh, but there, there is bigger politics at play here, and I don't think it's enough for the Labour Party uh, at Westminster to say we won't do this in England. They've already supported it in Scotland, and they're not saying they're going to repeal it. I mean, it's a very real possibility um, that someone accuses J.K. Rowling of inciting hatred, stirring up hatred, this new offence, and the Scottish police do go after her. It's a very real possibility. Well, there is, uh, and J.K. Rowling essentially is saying uh, that telling the truth about biological sex is not a hate crime. Uh, I think she's got a very strong case there. Uh, the difference, of course, is that when people start talking about gender, uh, that they believe that that in some, some way is a different subject that engenders hate. 
Uh, but you can't surely have a position where you want to stock up, talk about biological sex and uh, and all the ramifications of that to protect women and women's spaces, uh, and 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 then be accused of hate crime when you've actually explicitly also said you have no animus uh, towards transgender people. Well, I suppose the issue with this legislation is that it's not on in the eye of a, a neutral observer whether this gets investigated. It's not on the eye of the person who allegedly says the thing that is deemed to be stirring up hatred. It's on the eye not even of the person to whom that speech was directed at. Any casual observer of any interaction could say, those two people talking over there has offended me. Investigate it, please, please, Scotland. And Police Scotland will be compelled to. They have to. And Police Scotland have said that they will, because they've said they will investigate every su such complaint. It does, uh, from the outside, uh, look really bad law. And there is, of course, also another uh, in point of interest for the Prime Minister and, indeed, for parliamentarians at Westminster. Inasmuch as there is conflicting opinion... Uh, as to whether or not people, for instance, saying or writing uh, something that is published on the internet uh, in England but is opened uh, and read in Scotland uh, could then be actionable against the person that made it, uh, uh, typing mm. it in, in England. Were they to, uh, for instance, come to Scotland for the festival uh, in Edinburgh or some such event? Uh, so, so I think there are wider ramifications that mean this does need to be debated uh, beyond just the Holyrood Parliament. But I go back to my first point. There's no obvious way of this, this act being repealed because Labour was responsible for bringing it in too and they're not saying they're going to support its re uh, it being repealed. Yes, it does look like it's here to say and no number of... Uh... Protests will be able to change it quickly, will they? Um, thank you very much indeed, Brian Monteith, who is a former member of the Scottish Parliament. Of course, they're interesting to get his perspective mm. on all that. It, it, do you know, the, the thing that slightly... that slightly undermines all of this for me... Go on. ..is that there is already UK-wide law... Now, it's not as wide-reaching as the new Scottish law. The new Scottish law takes this much further than the UK-wide law. But in 2003, the Labour government across the whole of the UK passed something called the Communications Act. And Section 127 of the Communications Act outlaws grossly offensive speech. And there have been examples of people who've been arrested for what's known as grossly offensive speech. There's someone who took to Twitter to make a, a grossly offensive joke about Captain Tom Moore and about British soldiers. He actually happened to be Scottish, making the tweet in Scotland. And, and he uh, w w was, was spoken to by the police. This went through the court. I just wonder what the motivation is for Humza Yusuf. Is it that he wants everyone to live in harmony and for hatred to, to not exist? Or is there something more sinister about this whole thing, wanting con to control people as if they're his subjects? Well, it's been ratcheting up for many years. Uh, if it were up to me, this law in Scotland wouldn't exist, but neither would Section 127 and of the Communications Act. And I always remember that Act. speech. Lots of people pointing to that speech that Hamza Yusuf made about uh, all the white people uh, that have senior roles. Um, some people might say that that was a little bit hate-filled. Mm. But uh, anyway, in other news, um, and this is an interesting one that resurfaces every now and again, a Labour peer wants to see the government stop the exploitation of illegal migrants by bringing back... ID cards. Well, the idea of ID cards, anyway, of course, they were um, thought up by Tony Blair and then uh, never actually made it into law, but keep bubbling up every now and again. Of course, Lord Blunkett, who was the Home Secretary under New Labour, hopes that if his party get back into number 10, they'll raise this issue again and use ID cards to tackle the small boat crisis. Yes, once and for all. He says that without them, asylum seekers can avoid identification and avoid being sent to Rwanda and work within the UK illegally. So joining us now is former Home Office Minister Norman Baker. Norman, thanks very much. Um, ID cards, would that help in any way with the uh, migration crisis in the Channel? No, it wouldn't help at all. It's a complete red herring. Look, David Blunkett was the minister, Home Secretary, who wanted ID cards brought in more than Tony Blair did. And, of course, Tony, uh, David Blunkett, by the way, Tom, was also the Home Secretary for the Section 127 of the Communications Act. 
And David Blanket is quite authoritarian, quite a liberal, and in my view, wants far too much power for the state against the individual. Would it work? No, it wouldn't work. All it would happen, all it would do is drive people who come here further underground to get jobs where they don't need to demonstrate they have an ID card. They have to get a national insurance number anyway, they're going to work. So there's already some sort of safeguard there. All this would do would be to cost a lot of money, create a lot of bureaucracy, and a whole lot of inconvenience for law-abiding British people. Would it not help prevent um, migrants from absconding from their accommodation? So we have had a problem that the Home Office simply doesn't know where thousands, if not tens of thousands, of people are uh, situated in the country. Well, Essentially, they've been them lost. Them I mean, they, would, they, would, they would still be lost. They would still disappear somewhere, and they wouldn't be... I mean, the idea that they, have, they would not disappear because they have an ID card is not a sensible suggestion of basis to Emily. They would just, if they want to disappear, they'll disappear. Yes, I suppose one of the big arguments is they throw their papers overboard yeah. on the boats many times anyway. Yeah. But, Norman, what people say when they propose this is that one of the big reasons why people want to escape from France and move to the UK isn't that the UK is, is that much richer or safer than France. It's that France has ID cards and the UK doesn't. Well, look, Britain's got a long tradition of uh, not wanting governments of any colour to be too intrusive in individual matters, and something as a Liberal, I very much support that. And I'm very pleased that when the coalition came into power in 2010, one of the first things the Conservative and Lib Dem parties agreed on was to get rid of Labour's ID cards, which are not necessary and very intrusive. I come back to the point. If we have ID cards for migrants, I'll have to have them for British citizens too. And I don't want to have an ID card. I don't want them to show my ID card everywhere I go, because what this would do would be to create a database of every single person in the country on a standard system. I mean, you know how government IT systems don't work very well. So but hang is, on, Norman, you have, to use, you have to show ident ID for a lot of things already. Yes, What's the difference? Choose... What's the difference? Well, the, the difference is you choose your ID with a passport, a driving licence, a utility bill. There's not a central database of everybody on the same system. That's what's mm. different about ID cards. And as you say, Emily, you can already deal with matters like that with existing paperwork. You don't need something else on top. I think it's a, it's a really important point that there's uh, this this move towards a much more centralised society. I'm, I, I, I do sort of see where many people reach for ideas like this, though. It does seem that there is a sense of, of a lack of control. And when you're following that yeah. sort of narrative arc of control, you sort of do often end up walking down the path of saying the state should have all the answers here. How do you respond to that sense that, that there is a lack of control in the channel and that naturally leads people towards answers like ID cards? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's a non sequitur, Paul. I mean, the fact that this boat coming in is not going to be solved by ID cards. I mean, the idea that someone's going to say, hey, I'm not coming to Britain because you've got ID cards, is simply not going to happen. Look, I mean, control is a very dangerous word. We've got plenty of control in Putin's Russia, plenty of control in Xi Jinping and China and Erdogan and, and Turkey. I don't want to live in societies like that. And one of the great balances which, which has affected us for hundreds of years is the balance between the state and the individual. And as a Liberal, I want the individual to be able to control their lives free of unnecessary government interference. Well, this is an interesting one in terms of whether Keir Starmer takes this proposal on board. Mm -hmm. It will prove whether he's liberal-minded, yeah. cares about civil liberties, yeah. or whether he's, uh, you know, in favour of the state having more control yeah. in mm -hmm. the form of ID cards. A very interesting one. We'll see if he speaks on this and any reaction from Keir Starmer mm -hmm. himself. Thanks, Norman. Great to speak to you, former Home Office Minister Norman uh, Baker. Norman Baker is so right to mention the hundreds of years old liberty tradition in mm -hmm. the UK. Continental European countries had standing armies that could yeah. enforce laws. We never had a standing army in Britain. What did we have? We had a navy. The Navy stopped external threats but couldn't control our own populace. Liberty within our country protecting us from invaders without. Strong Navy, no standing army. That's the British tradition. Escaping fascism. Anyway, coming up, 10 million Brits are junk food addicts. Could they really be? Could they really be? But should they be charged more to access health care in this country? A controversial one. We'll have the debate. Breakfast, every day from 6 a.m. He's a genius. We know he's one of the few geniuses in the world. We have Mozart, we have perhaps Leonardo mm. da Vinci. He's mm. a genius. Of course he's worth 
uh, they... worth, worth studying. <clears throat> but, Chris, did they not think that Ben Johnson wrote some of his works? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Some people say that. There's lots of, there's lots of people out there who, who will question who wrote the plays. What's really important, of course, is the quality of the writing. And I, can I just add, I have some sympathy for my opponent in this debate because I'm afraid he's going to have to justify something which many people will disagree with. But good luck to him. But I think we all know Shakespeare was well, a genius. I'm sure my <laughs> that's here from Ryan. Well. This is Ryan Mark Parsons, who's a former star of The Apprentice. Tell mm. us more, Ryan. Well, I agree with the other guests. I'm not denying Shakespeare's cultural relevance and significance in history. I mean, I admire Shakespeare, but I guess in terms of his relevance, if you were to define relevance, that, well, the Oxford Dictionary says it's appropriate to the time, context and circumstances. And I think there's an argument to be had about whether Shakespeare is relevant in 2024. Let's just look at the language that he uses. It's extremely archaic. It's almost elitist because you have to have studied his works in order to understand the plays in which he wrote. So I just want to tear my hair out when you say that. I mean, well, you know, it's true. he survives for 500 years and then the Gen Zers chuck it up the wall. And you say it's not relevant. Oh, he's more relevant than ever because what Shakespeare does is tells us about human nature. The human nature in the 16th century, was no, or the 17th century, it was no different from today. You know, if you're looking at Vladimir Putin's headlines today, well, read Julius Caesar. It's just the language can be difficult, but that's good because we need to stretch children. We need to present children with things which challenge them. Don't always make life easier for children. Absolutely. No, make them stretch them a little bit. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 1.24 in the afternoon. Now, reports suggest that 10 million of us Brits are now hooked on junk food, addicted to junk food. And as a result, it's costing the NHS an eye-watering £58 billion a year. I find that very hard to believe, given the entire budget of the NHS is around £170 to £180 billion. A year. Yes, I saw an estimate of that would be more a third like 50. Of the entire budget. I saw an estimate of more of like 15 billion pounds a year, which of course is still very high. We don't know exactly how they work this all I out. Can, I can believe that 58 billion is the number that it's costing people mm. through the country, not just the NHS, but perhaps buying all the food or, or, or uh, making adjustments to their own lives and all the rest of it. Well, we've got some Santas wearing face masks there on the screen. Delicious. Uh, chocolate Santas, of course. Well, well junk <laughs> food, as it's known, although there's no official definition of what junk food is, but it's cheap and widely available, and 61% of us Brits say that the cost of living has affected our healthy eating habits in some way. Yes, ultra-processed food addiction is not currently recognised for clinical diagnosis. It doesn't exist. I think you can go to Overeating Anonymous... I'm sure you Overeaters can. Overeaters Anonymous. Come on, an addiction to processed food. I mean, it's ridiculous. I think it could be real. Not real. Could be real. Not real. Could be real. No. But research, <laughs> research suggests it is real, uh... putting unsustainable pressure on the NHS. So, should junk food addicts and the obese be made to pay more for healthcare in the UK if it's costing That's... us so much? Yeah, that's the debate we're having, not whether there's addiction or not. Um, that, that debate was clearly settled and won by me. Um, but, uh... Reckon, reckon. <laughs> yeah, no, the debate we're having is should obese people pay more for their health care in the United Kingdom? Joining us is the broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Kundi, who says yes, they absolutely should. And the actor and body positive influencer George Keywood, who says they should not. Well, Lizzie, let's start with you. You want the change. Why should obese people pay more to use the NHS? 
because it, as you said it is costing us 58 billion we have an obesity epidemic 40 percent of Adults in the UK are obese, one in five of children. It's out of control and something needs to be done. And if you're not going to be responsible for what you are putting in your mouth, I'm afraid there are consequences. And I do feel sorry for, you know, I have a friend who's obese and, and it is really, really tough and difficult, but you have to help yourself. And I think some of the, you know, the, the fast food chains are, have to be held responsible. I even think actually we should have like they do on, on smokers with all lung disease, show what it can do to your body because fast food is actually poisoning your whole body. And then sadly you can get addicted hang to on, Hang food, on, Lizzie. If I like have a cigarette, that is yourself. definitely bad for me. If I have a burger, I can have that in moderation and not have bad effects. I don't know, I saw you eat four donuts last week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid burgers, you'll lower your life expectancy. They have bad fat, fats that their hormones pumped <laughs> in. Your body thrives on food, but for the good, like medicine, if you're putting junk into your body, I'm afraid you're going to have the art defect and you're going to get not just, you know, it's a knock on effect to diabetes, mm. you know, heart disease and many other problems, which is very, very frightening. Well, a, a strong pitch there from uh, Lizzie. George, what do you say? Obesity is costing the NHS huge amounts. Why shouldn't those who are carrying extra weight to a dangerous, dangerous extent pay a little bit more? I don't know why I should have to cover the cost. I mean, l let's look at it realistically. Like, I, I pay what thirty to fifty thousand pound in income tax per year. Okay, I pay for private health care and I go to private GPs. So why should I have to pay more money to cover a bill for obese people as a whole? I feel like that's touching discrimination at some level. What about um, if think, you were using you know, the NHS, George? What about if you were using the NHS? You say you're using private health care already. Yeah, well, either, either way, in an emergency, I'm going to be using NHS, aren't I, like anyone would. Um, but I think what you've got to look at here is how many people are drunk on a Friday, Saturday night and end up in A&E. Yeah. You know, we've got to look at how many people are drinking and how many people are smoking, because I pretty much guarantee you the number will be more shocking than what it is of the obese people. I think obese people and fat people are a target. And people love to use them as a target. They love to say, well, it's the fat people's problem. It's their fault. It's their fault that it's costing this much. It's their fault that it's this problem and whatever. It's not their fault. OK, they're just sucked into the advertising campaigns by McDonald's and KFC and all the rest of them. You know, they're, they're, they're feeling down in themselves. So what they do is they eat and they comfort themselves. You know, my dad died in 2016. And what did I do? I, I drunk, smoked, done it all, you know, and stuffed my face as well alongside that. I think people have different ways of coping with life, uh, especially looking at coronavirus. I mean, Jesus, we're all stuck in our houses. What do you do? Mm. You eat. <laughs> you but know, but you George, eat, shouldn't you take, if, we, if, if, if not pay more for healthcare, shouldn't we take a mm. bit more care over ourselves? You, people, people. But, if if during during lockdown, for example, some people chose to eat more. Some people chose to take mm. up running. Well, look, I'm on a weight loss journey myself at the moment, and I've lost a fair bit of weight myself. I think it takes for the person to want to do it themselves, um, which is the problem, you know, because a lot of people are stuck in that in that moment where they're still eating, and they're not at the point where they've realised how much of an issue it actually is. Um, right, so should, should we just go back to Lizzie mindsets. now, because we're, we are mm. short on time? But, Lizzie, that point that why tax people who eat more? Why not people who drink more or, or even people who who ride horses that's a dangerous activity that ends up in hospitals Look, sometimes. also being dangerously <laughs> underweight those who are dangerously I'm underweight not excessive excessive drinking is good but what we're dealing with facts here and obesity is is out of control and it is putting huge pressure on the nhs which is in a shambolic state as it is and they can't afford to go on like this and you have to be responsible for yourself you have to be responsible if you exercise and what you put in your mouth and i think people need to be educated to know that the pizzas, the burgers, the fast foods are really killing yourself. You, you've got your body thrives on live good food, and this is not good nutrition. And people need to be educated without a doubt.
but we can't keep going on like we are. 58 billion to the NHS, it is, it's out of control, and I'm really sorry, but something needs to be done. Well, strong stuff. Thank you very much. Great to get both sides of that debate. George Keyword and Lizzie Kundi, great to speak to you both. I should say we... We use two different figures in this discussion, and both are valid. So the £58 billion is the combined cost of obesity to the Treasury, to the NHS, and to the Department of Work and Pensions and the economy as a whole. That's a projected cost. And the £15 billion a year is the, well, another estimate, but it's the estimated cost per year to the NHS itself. So that's why those are the two separate figures, but very much related. Yes, so the £58 billion would be one-third of the entire NHS budget, would, would would, would seem a little a little bit much, but it is important to note that yes, these costs they they're not just to healthcare; they, yeah. they spread out all over all over the wider economy too. Um, but much more to come on the program. Not least, should we be taking in more refugees from Gaza? We'll be having that discussion after your headlines. Very good afternoon from the GB newsroom. It's just gone 1.30, the headlines this hour. Israel has now confirmed one of its own airstrikes in Gaza killed the seven people working in the region, with the Israeli Prime Minister describing it as tragic and unintended. The group of seven aid workers, which included a British citizen, were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the World Central Kitchen logo. The NGO has claimed the Israel Defence Forces carried out the attack, despite coordinating their movements with the military. Those killed also include Palestinians and people from Poland and the US. Rishi Sunak has said there must now be a transparent investigation. Shocked and saddened to hear the reported deaths of aid workers in Gaza. We're urgently working to confirm all the details, but my thoughts right now with their friends and family, they're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised uh, and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered, and it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that, and we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently, because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. A 12-year-old child has been killed and two other children are in a serious condition after a shooting carried out by another child of the same age at a primary school in Finland. It's understood a permit for the handgun belonged to a relative of the suspect. Police say that 12-year-old has admitted to carrying out the shooting, but the circumstances are not yet clear. The Finnish Prime Minister says he is deeply shocked and that his thoughts are with the victims and their families. And in the UK, the Prime Minister is backing J.K. Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. It came into effect yesterday and outlaws hatred against people on certain grounds. But the author says it risks, risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. Rishi Sunak backs those concerns. He says that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. For the latest headlines and stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a look at the markets this afternoon. The pound will buy you $1.2566 and €1.1692. The price of gold is currently £1,795.93 per ounce and the FTSE 100 is at 7,968 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Welcome along to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. For many, it's a fine looking day out there today, dry and bright. Many of us seeing some pleasantly warm, sunny spells. But there is some rain in the southwest from this area of low pressure and across the far northeast, northeast of Scotland, under this weather front seeing persistent rain across Aberdeenshire, cold wind blowing across Shetland as well. The breeze picking up in the southwest as the rain creeps in across Devon, Cornwall, parts of Somerset, and just getting into South Wales by the end of the afternoon. Afternoon. One or two showers in southern Scotland, maybe northwest England, but for large parts of England, Wales, Northern Ireland, it's a fine, bright afternoon and quite warm in the sunny spells, 15, 16, feeling cold though.
with that wet weather lingering across uh, the northeast of Scotland. That uh, rain persists through much of the night and further south the rain will spread north. So most of us will see some wet weather through the course of the night. Some heavier bursts likely in parts of North Wales, northwest England. It's going to be pretty soggy too across the east and south of Northern Ireland. Temperatures mostly holding up in the single figures. 9, 10 degrees the low in parts of the south. But it's a soggy start to Wednesday for Northern England, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Uh, further rain and hill snow to come across the Grampians. Something a little drier in western Scotland and brighter conditions here. And it'll brighten up quite nicely too over the Midlands, South Wales and Southern England. Some decent spells of sunshine through tomorrow afternoon, which could see temperatures getting up to 15, 16, maybe 17 Celsius. The latest GB News travel. Hello, I'm Jules Buckley. There's a big queue building towards Edinburgh. The eastbound M8 from the M9 Junction 2 to Hermiston Gate at Junction 1 are lane blocked. A queue's building there is due to a collision. But there's a police incident on the M61. It's blocked both ways between Chorley at 8 and the Horwich turnoff at Junction 6, causing big queues. Southbound M6, Nutsford 19, down to Middlewich at 18, slow going. A collision means a lane shut and delays. Also southbound M6 before Nuneaton at 3. The inside lane's combed off again. There's a collision there. Southbound M1, 11A, down towards 11 around Luton. Are still queuing back to Flittick at 12, not helped by the ongoing roadworks there. And there was a collision earlier on, although that delay in the roadworks is starting to ease off. And for now, that's your very latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Afternoon, in Britain, it is 38 minutes past one. And now, the Telegraph newspaper has revealed that the British Museum is holding private discussions with four foreign governments about returning items in its collection. Hmm. Well, the document seen shows that since 2015, the museum has received 12 separate requests to hand back items. Well, the museum didn't reveal any details about which objects or which countries were involved but added that communications were ongoing. Now, currently, by law, the museum is prevented from permanently returning objects from its collection, except in extremely limited circumstances. So what exactly could these behind-the-scene conversations with foreign governments be all about? And is one of them Greece? And are we talking about the Elgin Marbles? <laughs> it might um, be, I would imagine. <laughs> but, but what are the other four? That's the four, four different governments around the world. Uh, really interesting stuff here. And, of course, the man in charge, George Osborne chair of the museum. But uh, let's speak with the cultural commentator Richard Fitzwilliams now, because, Richard, a lot of people will be thinking, hang on, if the British Museum starts returning items, what sort of domino set are we setting in train here? Will there be any museum anywhere in the world that's left with anything? Yes, this, of course, is the fear, and this is the concern that lurks behind the way the British Museum is behaving, which isn't all, or sometimes doesn't always seem rational. For example, there are uh, several uh, Ethiopian sacred relics in the British Museum, which can only be seen by Ethiopian clergy. It can't be seen by anyone else, including the trustees, and yet the British Museum is not giving them or returning them to Ethiopia as a Apparently requested. Now, that sort of thing doesn't make sense. This is apparently a mix of governments approaching privately, but we do know, according to the Telegraph, that India wants some sculptures, the Rapanui Easter Island, there are sculptures there, they, of course, the issue of the Benin bronzes, and I suspect that we are looking now in your film on the uh, Parthenon or the Elgin Marbles, uh, fifth century sculptures, which uh, the 
40-year, very, very bitter dispute with Greece, removed by Lord Elgin in the uh, early 19th century, and Ottoman ruled Greece, and Greece wants them back. I have to say, going up the Acropolis last December and then to the museum, which mm. is being to house them, you can certainly see what the Greeks would like. The whole point with this is, since 1963, as you pointed out, the, the British Museum, the National Museums, because several local museums and in Scotland have been returning objects, cannot by law return on a permanent basis. However, they may loan. It's that mm. that I think is probably behind this. Uh, Richard, do you think that should change? Do you think the British Museum and the British government should be more sympathetic to foreign governments who say that they have their cl this claim to these objects and they want them back? Well, I would have thought so because there was a very good example very recently where, um, in looted by British troops in 1897, some of the Ashanti crown jewels, as they were called, have been returned on loan. Now, the point here is that the Ghanaian government would regard them as stolen. Therefore, how can you loan back that which you regard as stolen? It's very difficult to agree that. But if it was in fact the king of the Ashantis, who was here for the coronation and uh, was involved in talks on this, they were loaned specifically to him. So in that sort of circumstance, I think the national museums and their movements here in France and in Germany, in the Netherlands, the Rijks Museum, for example, has returned Benin bronzes. I would have thought it very, very important as we move into a new era where, of course, all the accusations of restitution of colonial guilt and so forth are very much to the fore. Certainly, national museums, I think, should have more flexibility. Hmm. What, what, what do we gain? From this, just just from, purely, let's let's set aside any questions of, of colonial guilt or anything like that. Just on a pure cost-benefit analysis, if we're giving away treasures that Britain has had in many cases for hundreds of years before any of us were born, if we're giving them away, what do we get in return? <laughs> Well, the answer, of course, is, as I mean, certainly, as far as Greece is concerned, the answer would undoubtedly be goodwill, but also, of course, Greece, the cradle of democracy dating back all those centuries and so forth. But in fact, of course, the problem is where does it start, where does it end? And that's impossible to answer because, of course, so many national museums, especially in Western countries, are repositories of vast collections, some of them looted, some of them obtained legitimately. It's a complete mix as a result. You can only do this by a case-by-case -case basis. What you undoubtedly get from this, or should get from this, is a certain amount of goodwill, especially if it's negotiated, as it would be if this was, it did involve the Elgin marbles, you get mm -hmm. something in um, from Greece. So, in fact, it wouldn't just be a one-way uh, street, even though, of course, the a museum like the British Museum, and of course that had this dreadful business of 1,800 uh, objects reportedly mm. being removed, which wasn't expected, um, you would have some sort of quid pro quo where you wouldn't suddenly, because this would be ridiculous, the British Museum meant be emptying its uh, collections. That would be out of the question. I don't know. I see that happening. I see that happening. So many claims to the artefacts that are in the British Museum. You could have a bit of an emptying out, couldn't you? And why stop there, though? Why, stop, why, why give them to a central museum of another country? Mm. Why not return them to the precise locations from which they came? No museum anywhere should ever exist because it's moving things from one place to another by necessity of having it in a place where well, in which people can view it. Richard, we're going to have to leave it there. Really great to get your take on all this. We'll speak to you again, I'm sure, about this. Um, Richard Fitzwilliams, cultural commentator. It's funny your question that you asked about what do we get in return? No, this isn't about getting will? anything in return. Good what can you do with that, goodwill? They, you know, these countries say these artefacts were stolen and they should be returned to their rightful Greece place. Greece didn't exist in the early 1800s. Uh, it, was, it was a portion of the Ottoman Empire. Well, we're not, not just talking about the Erdogan Erdogan marbles. We're not just talking about the Elgin marbles, but wh wh where I would certainly agree with you is that this is a slippery slope and I do not particularly want the British Museum, which has looked after these goods, although weren't a few things nicked.
not that long ago. Well, I mean, I, 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 there, are, there are certain things that, for example, Napoleon stole and then we took from Napoleon mm. and then... I mean, like, at, at what point uh, yeah. on, on the, in the chain of transaction do you go back and what was legitimate, what was bought under duress? Different people argue different things on all of these objects. Yes, contested. Very much let us know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.com. But coming up, Hugh Edwards, he's set to be announced as the BBC's most expensive newsreader, despite being off air, not reading the news for eight months. BBC licence fee payers... Good use of their money. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. Has the NHS killed your relative and then lied to you about it? There is an alleged cover-up culture in the NHS. They lie to you about why your loved one died, about poor care, then bury documents with evidence in them, and they try to silence staff who speak out. This is according to the NHS Ombudsman. There are around 11,000 avoidable deaths every year. 11,000. Someone's mum dies, their children know something dodgy happened, and then they're met with a rotten culture, including the altering of care plans, the disappearance of crucial documents, and complete denials. They lie to you, but they really get away with it because the NHS is like a religion and people dare not criticise it. You'd be accused of NHSophobia. The annual budget is around £180 billion and we now have about 2 million people working for the NHS. They cannot keep blaming everything on being underfunded and understaffed. If they're covering up medical negligence, it means the problem doesn't get dealt with and it keeps happening. And that is the fault of the NHS managers, the people who run it. They've got the money for 837 non-clinical staff working at English hospitals on the highest paid Band 9 contracts, which is between £99,000 and £115,000 a year. How many nurses would that pay for? How many junior doctors? And they've got the time on their hands to think about making the NHS the world's first carbon-neutral health service. They've got time to consider whether women in labour should be picked up by an electric ambulance that might have to be recharged en route to the hospital. There are NHS managers with a budget of £180 billion, 2 million members of staff, and they're crying about being understaffed and under-resourced. If they spent more time looking after patients instead of finding ways to cover up avoidable deaths, then maybe we'd have a better health service. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Right, well, Hugh Edwards is set to be announced as the BBC's most expensive newsreader, despite being suspended last year. Yes, being paid for not reading the news. Well, the long-serving presenter was embroiled in controversy after allegedly uh, there were payments for nude images from a younger individual. He's yet to return to our screens, having been hospitalised with serious mental health issues. So we're asking just why is the sideline presenter still costing the licence fee payer potentially more than £400,000 a year? This is quite extraordinary. Let's pose that very question to former BBC royal correspondent Michael Cole. Uh, Michael, lots of people will be a little bit aghast at the sum that he's still being paid despite not doing his job. Good afternoon, Emily. Good afternoon, Tom. This is symptomatic of the waste that is endemic within the bureaucratic BBC. 
precisely at the time it's put up the license fee by an inflation busting a sum to £169.50, a license fee that uh, more people are ignoring, uh, and it's down to the honest people like you and me uh, to pay this sum. Uh, I wonder how uh, Hugh Edwards, who we see there, uh, squares this with his conscience. He's a much advertised church going Presbyterian Christian, um, and um, he's taking money for nothing. Uh, it, it says in the Bible, uh, a laborer is worth his hire, which was quoted by Geoffrey Chaucer later. But uh, what in the case when the laborer is actually not laboring, but actually leaning on his shovel? Uh, and that has happened for a considerable amount of time, as you've just said, Emily. Mm. This goes to the absurdity, I repeat it, the absurdity of the BBC paying Hollywood sums to people mm. who are not worthy of those huge salaries. There are 100 people within the BBC and broadcasting generally who could do that job. When I was at the BBC, I was there for a fifth of its existence. Newsreaders like Richard Baker, uh, Kenneth Kendall, Robert Dougal, Moira Stewart, they were all staff announcers on staff contracts, very modest sums of money, a fraction of what Hugh Edwards is being given. Uh, it is absurd because it's a false marketplace. Uh, those people who are getting these sums from the BBC could not go anywhere else, and I say that on the record, and <laughs> get such huge sums of the licensed payers' money, our money. No, it is extraordinary. Just a tenth of the salary allegedly being paid to Hugh Edwards would be a very good salary indeed. And yet, here he is on ten times that. But, but I suppose here, Michael, to, to mount a defence, Hugh Edwards has not been accused of any crime. Indeed, the police investigated and said no crime had been committed. This is a, a, a man who has allegedly paid money for legal pictures from an albeit young adult. Uh, he is now uh, suffering serious mental health problems. Uh, is there not a moment here for compassion? Yeah, you've summed it up perfectly. He says, or people speaking on his behalf say, he's not well enough to face a BBC inquiry. Well, I think we're entitled to ask if he's not well enough after all this time, when will he be well enough? And to go back to what you were saying about salaries, let me just inject a little bit of personal <laughs> history. Uh, I worked for the BBC for 20, more than 20 years. My work won two Royal Television Society awards. I covered wars, civil disturbances, riots, uh, bush wars. I was beaten up and put in hospital in, in Belfast. Uh, and I contracted hepatitis in the jungles of Guatemala during the confrontation wow. with Belize. It, the highest salary, ladies and gentlemen, I ever got in that time, wait for it, was £47,000. And I was proud to be a BBC reporter. Well, you were ludicrously <laughs> underpaid, Michael Cole, ludicrously underpaid. Well, I was proud to do it, Emily, because I believed in public service broadcasting. I have to ask, does the BBC any longer believe in public service broadcasting, or does it think it's gone to Hollywood? Oh, it's a strong, well, strong I, point, and many I people think, will yeah. be looking at the amount they pay for their licence fee and thinking, is this, is this being spent wisely, and could this be, frankly, a lot lower? Michael Cole, thank you so much for bringing us yeah, I that, think the actually, that is, personal information Why as well, is the isn't? investigation taking so long? Yes. And then we wouldn't have, they, they wouldn't be continuing to pay for no work. Huge questions, but uh, much more to cover on the show. Indeed, we're coming up to a big debate. This flag, this flag that Team GB is saying you can buy as the Olympic flag this year. Well, is it totally uh, politically correct nonsense? That's what Nigel Farage thinks. Or is this a refreshing update on a traditional flag? Refreshing new palette. <laughs> we'll be having that debate after this. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News.
Hello, welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Across some central southern parts, there will be a bit of sunshine tomorrow, but otherwise it's looking pretty wet and there's some rain to come tonight as well. That's because we have an area of low pressure to the southwest of us and that is driving a feature northwards as we go through the rest of today. So ending the day across parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England on a mostly dry note, but rain in the southwest will feed its way across much of England, Wales and into Northern Ireland overnight with some persistent rain continuing across eastern parts of Scotland, bringing a bit of hill snow over the higher ground here. Temperatures not dropping much for many of us because of the unsettled weather, although a touch of frost is possible across the far north of Scotland. Many areas then waking up tomorrow morning to a pretty wet start and staying wet across northern parts with some further, at times, heavy and persistent rain. Further south, though, a drier picture. Yes, there will be a few showers around, but we should also see some bright or sunny spells develop. In any sunshine, feeling pleasantly warm, highs of around 16 Celsius, but colder further north and feeling it in the wet and the windy weather here. Later on, as we go through tomorrow afternoon into the evening, a swathe of more persistent rain is going to affect parts of Devon, Cornwall and into South Wales as well. Looking ahead through the rest of the week and the unsettled picture does remain. In fact, it is likely to turn very windy by the end of the week, but temperatures rising could get to 20 Celsius by Saturday. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel.
Good afternoon, Britain. It's two o'clock on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. It is. Now the Prime Minister has leapt to the defence of J.K. Rowling after she dared the Scottish police to arrest her over her views on transgender issues. So what do the people of Scotland make of this all? Who do they back? Humza Yusuf, Rishi Sunak or J.K. Rowling? We've been on the ground asking you. And total woke nonsense. That's what Nigel Farage says about Team GB's diverse rebrand of our union flag ahead of the Olympics. The designers claim they're simply refreshing the colour palette. But we'll be getting the opinion of the president of the Flag Institute. Who better? And a right-wing group of Tory MPs are said to be wanting a trust-style leader to replace Rishi Sunak if they lose the next election. Is that a sensible or welcome idea? I'm in two minds about this flag. Okay, I really am. On the one hand, oh, just side looking at it. I mean, you, why, why do you need to change something that is, in my view, probably the best flag in the world? Just sort of the design of it. It draws you into the centre. It represents different nations of our United it's a Kingdom. Beautiful I think, flag. I think the only flag that really rivals it is probably the Japan flag, just through its simplicity. You know, the, the red spot in the middle of the white sheet. I mean, for example, the American flag is just a mess. I've never thought that that was a good flag. But the British flag, there's something about it. So changing it seems very odd. But on the other hand, it's the Olympics, and the Olympics always just just sink my heart when they show the logos and the mascots and all that. Do you remember the 2012 logo? It was just um, about the worst logo I could imagine for anything. These jagged edges and bright garish colours. Well, do you know what? Do you would you do you understand why Nigel Farage, for example, would slam this rebrand as woke nonsense? I think because it comes so quick off the heels of the St George's Cross mm. being manipulated on the England football kit. It does, and it now does it's a... yet another remake. It's a sense that all of these national symbols just just have to be changed mm. for the sake of it. But on the other hand, it's very often the Olympics teams they. They just, they, they all, it's disappointing, but perhaps not surprising. I mean, the designers say it's just a refreshing new colour palette. Um, so that's their defence. They clearly like it. They think it's attractive. Do you at home it's like it? I think I'm, I'm getting, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, some, some sort of epileptic fit looking at it. All the, all the different lines and the squiggles and the sort of colour. I mean, why does it need to be this complicated? So it's not necessarily the colours you don't like, but the fact that it has all these uh, weird and wonderful... Patterns. Textures, textures and patterns, dots, spots, wibbly lines, bright pinks, dark purples. I mean, it's just a complicated mess. Well, the Surely sun... a flag should be simple. Well, the sun says it's a union joke. Do you agree? GBV's at gbnews.com, but it's your headlines. Tom, Emily, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. It's just gone two o'clock and we start with news uh, on the situation in Gaza, where Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that the is airstrike unintentionally struck innocent people there, killing seven aid workers, including a British citizen. The group were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the logo of World Central Kitchen. The NGO claims the Israel Defence Forces carried out the attack despite coordinating their movements with the military. Those killed also include Palestinians and people from Poland and the US. Speaking earlier, Rishi Sunak said there must now be a transparent investigation. Shocked and saddened to hear the reported deaths of aid workers in Gaza. We're urgently working to confirm all the details, but my thoughts right now with their friends and family, they're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised uh, and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered, and it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that, and we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently, because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. A 12-year-old child has been killed and two other children are in a serious condition after a shooting carried out by another child of the same age at a primary school in Finland. It's understood a permit for the handgun used in that incident belonged to a relative of the suspect. Police say the 12-year-old has admitted to carrying out the shooting, but the circumstances are not yet clear. The Finnish Prime Minister has said he is deeply shocked and that his thoughts are with the victims and their families. 
Here in the UK, the Prime Minister is backing JK Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. It came into effect yesterday and bans hatred on people on certain grounds. But the author says the law risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. Rishi Sunak backs her concerns and he says that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. Shadow Minister Pat McFadden told GB News this morning that Labour would have no plans for similar laws if it wins the next election. We want proper enforcement of the anti-hate crime laws that are there and make sure that the right penalties are in place to protect people. We're not planning to legislate for new crimes in this area and I don't think J.K. Rowling should be arrested. Well, the government is facing criticism of its new plan, expand, plan to expand funded childcare for working parents in the first week of it being rolled out across the country. Meeting parents in Hartlepool this morning, the Prime Minister rejected claims that nurseries can't cope with increasing demand as a result of the new policy. Rishi Sunak says the package of support for families has been introduced in stages to give time for more places to be made available. Adidas says that it will block any German football shirts featuring the number 44 amid concerns over a resemblance to the SS Nazi symbol. The new kits were launched last month ahead of Germany hosting the European Championships. But a historian has flagged similarities with the logo for SS, which was a Nazi paramilitary organisation. The country's football association says that it didn't support, spot the similarities when the design was approved, but that it will now be changed. Prices in shops are rising at the slowest rate for two years, that's according to new figures. In March, shop prices were up 1.3%, slowing from 2.5% the month before. The British Retail Consortium has said that discounts on popular Easter treats and essentials, as well as promotions on electricals and clothing, have helped to keep those prices down. And the cost of a postage stamp is going up from today as Royal Mail moves to address a drop in demand. A first-class stamp will set you back £1.35, that's a rise of 10 pence, and it's the same increase for second-class stamps, which will now cost 85 pence. Twelve months ago, a first-class stamp cost just 95 pence. It's the fourth price rise in just two years and comes after warnings that lower demand for postage is pushing up costs for Royal Mail. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For now, though, it's back to Tom and Emily. It's coming up to 2.08 in the afternoon. Now, Rishi Sunak has leapt to the, to the defence of J.K. Rowling after the author challenged the police. She dared the police to arrest her over new hate crime laws, which took effect yesterday. The Prime Minister said the Conservative Party will always protect free speech, adding people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. But how do the people of Scotland feel? Well, our man on the ground, Tony Maguire, has been asking just that. I, I, I don't think so. I think, quite honestly, the police have got enough to do. I think at this moment in time they don't even have enough time to investigate more serious crimes like burglaries, etc. So I think they've got enough to do, and I think it's just maybe a wee bit too far. Oh, I definitely think it is, yes. Uh -huh. we, we wouldn't like to be censored in our own home. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm going to get a T-shirt printed which says the four most dangerous words in Scotland. What do you think? That's it. I think it's going to take too much time for the police to go and try and do anything with that. To me, it's a waste of time, but that's just me. Just exactly the same opinion, no, I don't think so. No. It's too time consuming. The police have got far too many things to, to be getting on with. Goodness me, Tony, d did you speak to a single person that was enthusiastically in support of this change in the law? Yeah, it's interesting that, isn't it? And I mean, I, I kind of actually wanted to start on that. Obviously, at GB News, we, we strive to give both sides of the debate. Um, and, you know, last year during the GRR debate, we, we saw that, that there were really strong views on either side, you know, and it was, I won't, I won't say 50-50 split, but it was something of a, a moderately even split. And yet this, I mean, I'm going at this now pretty much two or three days, and the outpouring um, in public places, not a particularly, you know, demonstration, 
illustrations or anything that's particularly lopsided. Um, and people all have huge questions here. And I mean the question there that I actually asked those people because it's something that I think that a lot of people have picked up on, inclu including Rishi Sunak this morning, was that, you know, this will allow police to investigate reports of so-called hate crimes um, in people's own homes or in the, the dinner table, watching the TV at night on the sofa. And, you know, I wanted to ask them, how do you feel about that in particular and how, how that can actually come into your own home? Should anything that we say in our own home be open for debate by the authorities? And mm. as you heard from those people there, that was a really resounding no. Yes, very interesting indeed. Thank you so much for getting the views of people in Glasgow. Very interesting indeed. That was, of course, Tony McGuire, our Scotland reporter. That T-shirt idea that that one chap said, the four most dangerous words in Scotland, what do you think? There you go. Oh. Himsa Yusuf doesn't want to know what you think about anything in case there could be... It could... Uh, incite hatred, stir up hatred. And of course, Tony, in your own home, in your own home. Of course, Tony's in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Glasgow is a stronghold of the Scottish National Party. Yep. You'd expect to find at least one or two people who would say, yes, this is a great law, this is a great idea. And he really tried, he really tried. But we couldn't find anyone, spoke to lots of people, but none of them in support. Yeah, lots of people are just saying it's a waste of police time. They mm. should focus on burglaries and the like, things that actually are real crimes. But joining us now is the director of case operations at the Free Speech Union, uh, Benjamin Jones. Benjamin, I imagine you have lots of concerns. Are you gearing up for a big public battle between J.K. Rowling and Humza Yusuf? We certainly are, and hundreds of people in Scotland have joined the Free Speech Union in the last few days alone. Uh, we're raising, we've uh, crowdfunded £10,000 and more in the last few days as well to help pay uh, legal fees for people who are caught on the wrong side of this uh, particularly stupid statute. Uh, and we have an arrangement with a top law firm uh, to arrange for solicitors and legal assistance for people who are uh, arrested or charged or investigated. Now, Benjamin, just for those that don't know, quickly explain, what, what is the Free Speech Union? We were set up uh, in 2020 and we are a membership organisation of more than 13,000 people, uh, growing particularly rapidly this week. Uh, and we stand up for the rights of all members of the public across the United Kingdom. Uh, to speak their minds on all sorts of issues. So we are typically engaged in defending people in employment disputes, uh, in campaigning for better legal protection and better law uh, to protect the right of free speech uh, in the UK, which I think is uh, sorely needed. Benjamin, what do you think the motivation behind this legislation is? Do you believe that Humza Yusuf, First Minister of Scotland, genuinely believes that this is what will create a harmonious society in Scotland where there is absolutely no hate and it eradicates any nastiness in society? Or do you think there's something more sinister behind it? I can't peer into the man's soul. I think it's going to be a complete disaster. I think the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Perhaps he has intentions which are good. Uh, perhaps that's what he thinks the result of this act will be. Uh, but I think looking at it, you couldn't design a piece of legislation uh, that would be a better laser-guided missile to target J.K. Rowling uh, or women and men who believe in the reality of biological sex. Uh, those people really are under threat now, and they are, of course, the majority of the population who are now going to feel unable to speak their minds on this issue and on others as well. I suppose one of the big concerns that people have is just how much support this bill, when it was a bill, had going through the Scottish Parliament. Of course, now an act of Parliament. But this wasn't just uh, the brainchild of the SNP. This was supported by the Scottish Green Party, the Scottish Lib Dems and the Scottish Labour Party too. Yes, that's correct. It was a cross-party effort and uh, Conservatives voted against it. It has also been uh, opposed by uh, Joanna Cherry, for instance, the SNP MP. Uh, so there is opposition from all sorts of quarters to it. We're very afraid about a piece of legislation like this uh, coming for the rest of the country mm. following the election. Um, it's worth, though, pointing out some of the comments that have been made by uh, members, ministers of the Scottish Government in defending this Act. We, they seem to say that it won't be as bad as we think it will be. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much sort of proactive vocal uh, defence for the Act or what it's going to do. Uh, and I saw that the Community Minister for Scotland uh, has said over the weekend that misgendering somebody online will now be a police matter. Uh, so that is the uh, new grief. dark age into which Scotland has been thrust by this piece of legislation. And I think it's interesting listening to those clips just then. Uh, members of the public rightly 
uh, very concerned about the idea that what you say in your own home is not going to be protected. And this isn't just about trans issues, for instance. This is also uh, an act that is going to uh, tackle discrimination based on age. So if you're in your own home and you refer to your own husband or your own father as a grumpy old git, you can be reported to the police who have promised to investigate every single complaint. And to make a complaint, you can go into these pop-up hate crime reporting shops, which have been set up across Scotland, including in what we might euphemistically call an adult shop in Glasgow. It's completely mm. ludicrous. These informant centres, it sounds yeah. like something out of 1930s Germany. I mean, honestly, and are I they mean, trying to make this the most ludicrous parody of a law? Thank you very much, Dr Benjamin Jones, great to speak to you. Mm. And of course, the SNP have also been accused of demonising young working class men. Uh, because they said, we know that young men aged 18 to 30 are most likely to commit hate crime. So they know who they're going after, And when they say commit seems. hate crimes, they mean say something, say something slightly mean. off colour. Yeah. Well, uh, let's, let's go on to another story now, because we were talking about this just before the news headlines. This rebrand of our flag, of the flag of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. This has caused yet more backlash following the rebrand of Nike's uh, St George's Cross for the Euro uh, football competition this summer. It seems that flag after flag... It's being changed. Being messed being around altered. with. I mean, judging from our inbox, people are not impressed by this uh, diverse rebrand. Team GB's Union Jack supporters' flag has turned pink and purple for the Paris Olympics this year. Shall we just leave our flag alone? Well, uh, shall we speak to the president of the Flag Institute, Malcolm Farrow, who I'm sure has an opinion on this one. Um, Malcolm, lots of people Good getting afternoon. in touch saying exactly that. Leave our flag alone. Absolutely. Leave our flag alone. Trying to muck around with the national symbol is the wrong thing to do. Had they been designing a dress, a bikini, a bedspread or something like that, that's fair enough. You, you can play around with colours and shapes and designs. Of course you can. But not a national flag. A national flag is a symbol which belongs to every single member of the nation. It's a symbol which people have fought and died for. It is the symbol of our freedom as a liberal democracy. It is the symbol which people flee from dictatorships to come here and live in peace and harmony beneath. And no one should muck it around. We should treat it with dignity, respect, care, attention, and love it for what it is. The Union flag is a very special flag when it comes to national flags around the world. Many, many countries have seen their flags change, not even in the last 100 years, in the last 70 years. They're relatively new things. Uh, the flag of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland grew over years of amalgamating different flags, very ancient flags, together. It's a symbol of, of, of unity for everyone in our country. Uh, how important is it that these symbols remain unadulterated? I think it's crucially important. The, the Union flag, well, the first one was designed in 1606, and the only change in 1801 was when the, the thin uh, red diagonal for St Patrick's Cross was added mm. for Ireland. And uh, that flag, oh, the union of, uh, of the, the various nations beneath it, is the most successful union of independent countries the world has ever seen. Uh, and it's just the most amazing, uh, most amazing symbol, which we have, of course, exported all over the world. There are half a dozen other countries which use that symbol within their national flags, and by golly, they wouldn't muck around with it. There's about 200 versions of it flying today above yacht clubs, b uh, companies, shipping lines, uh, government departments all over the world, and not even just within the Commonwealth. Some places outside the Commonwealth still use that flag mm. in one capacity or another. Absolutely, no one should be mucking around with it. Malcolm, and they've done the wrong thing. What do you say to their explanation? They say this is just a refreshing change in colour palette, and that it's flexible, and that it's designed to appeal to a, a new generation of, of, of athletes and supporters. <laughs> no, not buying it? Would you like the polite answer or the impolite answer? Oh, well, hopefully I ought the to give you the polite answer. To keep it, clean. it is complete <laughs> nonsense. Complete nonsense. Like I said at the beginning, had it been a bedspread, had it been a dress, had it been a bikini or a table 
cover or something. That's fair enough. You can do what you like with colour palettes for that, but not for a national flag. And the fact is, they have called it the Union Jack supporters flag or something like that. It is not a Union Jack, and it should never have been made into a flag for hoisting or waving. Well, there you go, Tom. You can keep hold of your uh, Technicolor Union flag <laughs> Dude, trunks. Oh, oh, oh my! Swimming trunks. I don't. I think maybe I should get some now. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a good idea. Um, well, you can start. Malcolm... You can start with a mug. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks. What a tremendous mug! <laughs> Marvelous. Malcolm Farrow, president of the Flag Institute. Really appreciate your time uh, on Good Afternoon you. Britain today. Thank you. Oh, good stuff. I enjoyed I do, that. I do you think? Uh, th Look, talking through the history of, of the flag, mm. the sort of that the, um, uh, James the Sixth and First first sort of came up with this idea of merging the the the, the cross of St George and, yeah. uh, and the saltire in Scotland, it is I think the most remarkable visual thing. It draws your eye to the centre. These crossing crosses. It is something that stands out. And when, when I sort of... You know when there are lots of flags up for some sort of national day or at some international event and whatever, you can't help but look at the Union it's, Jack there and it, 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 it's the best one. It just I is. Think, I think he's convinced you. I think he's convinced you that we shouldn't have a pink and purple representation of the Union flag. I think that's you sold. Anyway, how do you, the great British public, feel? We've been asking you on the street. Should we take a little listen? It's a disgrace. Why not leave it as it is? It's, you know, our traditional flag. Why mess with it like the England football shirt? Just leave it alone. It's, that is the proper flag for our country, and that's what should be up. Well, I think it's a bit weird, the change in it. It's the flag to the flag, isn't it? It's been there centuries, isn't it? So keep it the same. I quite like it, but I think that the red could be red. Um, yeah, nothing really against it. Team GB should be up the Union Jack in Great Britain, but to me, that's not. Oh, well, there you go. Well, we found one person who liked it. <laughs> one person who liked although, it. Although wanted the red a bit redder. <laughs> well, <laughs> much more to come on the programme. Coming up, could a Liz St Truss-style Tory leader be the answer to Conservative Party woes? We'll be discussing that after this. I'm Gloria De Piero. This is GB News, Britain's election channel. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6 a.m. Can we talk about um, uh, opening up the new uh, Bond role to someone, Alex? <gasps> and, oh, um, yes. This is an actor called Aaron Taylor Johnson. Right. Do you remember when the director of the Fifty Shades of Grey films had a young, young boyfriend, really, really young, like half her age. It was in all the papers at the time. Well, it turns out that was him. He broke his career, I think, in a film called Kick-Ass, which was, I, I watched it, really great film. You can't compare, what's his name? Who's, who's the last Bond? Daniel, Daniel Craig. Craig. Daniel Craig, you can't to Roger, compare... You but can't. you can't compare Roger Moore to Sean Connery, either. No. Who's your favourite Bond? Uh, my favourite Bond is Piers Brosnan, probably. Same. Really? Oh, maybe come on, yes. Sean Connery, maybe Both Sean. the classics. Yeah. I'm quite keen on Roger Moore. So, but I, I quite like the kind of uh, the ironic raise but, of the eyebrow and all well, that. Well, interesting, this sort of puts to death all of those rumours that James Bond was going to be a woman, James Bond was going to be a black man. There was lots of different rumours going around of what they were going to do with Idris his Elba would be good. He hasn't signed yet. A he feminist, I would say, James Bond shouldn't be a woman. I totally agree. Because we need to have our own stories that we tell yeah, and our own heroes. We don't need to, yes. to kind of go in on that. We just need to have a story that celebrates a woman, I think. I agree. Who is your favourite, Eamon? So I do think, if you, if you look at them all, there's not a bad one amongst them, mm. but um, personally, I got to know Roger Moore and um, an absolute gentleman oh. and a man who was a star in every sense of the word, and an impossibly handsome looking mm. man. Mm. Pierce, I think Pierce, very, very good, and Pierce again is a very likable oh, yeah. fellow, very, very, very likable. <laughs> yeah. It's um, funny you say that the appetite, I think, for James Bond kind of is still there, but they are reinventing it. And the fact, that, the fact that they change it and kind of go with the time. I thought Daniel Craig was very good, actually. You can't I just avoid struggled them. with Daniel Craig the most because I just couldn't cope with the blonde Bond. So the idea of a female Bond or, you know, <laughs> it, I, I anything couldn't else, cope yeah. with Daniel Craig. So. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend.
That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Dubry and this is GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 2.25 in the afternoon. You're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now we're hearing that there is a plan to install a Liz Truss-style Tory leader by the popular conservatism group. Yes, the Popcons, as they're known, a movement aiming to restore democratic accountability and deliver popular conservative policies. Well, they've reportedly devised a plan to introduce a future Tory leader aligned with Liz Truss's views on economic policy. So, presumably, that means small state, free markets, but, of course, Liz Truss's downfall was partially to do with lots of spending, wasn't it, Tom? It was. Well, I, I, it's, it, it's my belief that had she not uh, committed to spending up to £200 billion mm. on, on fixing energy prices, then all of her tax cuts altogether, that was only adding up to around £50 billion. And so what, what upset the markets more? Was it the £50 billion in tax cuts or the potentially £200 billion in extra spending? I mean, I, I think it's, it's yes, fairly those, clear, Those right? woke left markets... Anyway, this comes after the probability of a Conservative defeat has intensified, of course, after continued polls suggest the likelihood of a significant loss. Well, you could say that again. Well, let's speak to the former advisor to David Cameron, Philip Blonde, on this issue, and perhaps on the issue of replacing Rishi Sunak at all. Because, uh, Philip, the, the plan, as it, as it is being reported, is, of course, for after a Conservative Party election defeat. I suppose the big question there, will, I mean, will there be any sort of dregs of the Conservative Party left to lead? Well, I mean, I've been talking about this for some six months now. I... I said I thought there would be a leadership contest because the Conservatives, I, I feared, would go below 100 seats. At the time I was speaking, they're around 220 or so. And so it's proved they, they're continuing to lose support. And so the argument against doing anything uh, is weakening and weakening. And mm. we've got the local elections coming up. So... It would not surprise me if there was a no-confidence vote shortly after the cataclysmic uh, local election defeats before the election. And really what you're seeing is lots of people are talking about after the election, but in reality they're preparing for before the election because the, the odds on the balloon going up um, after the local elections have, sh have shortened considerably. Mm. And it's sort of 50 50 now as to whether there will indeed be a vote of no confidence. I mean, Philip, a lot of people would roll around laughing or at least scoff at the idea that uh, a Liz Truss style leader is the answer to the Conservative Party's woes because, of course, Liz Truss didn't last too long in the position. But others think the Conservative Party needs to get back to its roots. And part of that has to be moving towards a more low tax economy, a more free market economy and everything that goes with, with that. I mean, at this point, do you think it would be madness to replace, to oust Rishi Sunak and replace him with someone who is more like Liz Truss in that respect? Well, there's two points. Let's separate them. I don't think it's madness to change leader because I think a new leader now, even though uh, can mitigate the losses and get the Conservative Party back where they can challenge. Labour will have a very difficult time governing. Um, the social liberalism, if I can call it that, the trans agenda is very unpopular in the country. And I think they could be subject to challenge by a revivified Conservative Party. So I think it's all to fight for. I mean, I think a defeat is baked in, but it's the scale of the defeat that isn't. But, Philip, is there not a risk that changing leader 
would make... Uh, what, what the argument is that the Labour Party's been making all of this week is Tory chaos, Tory chaos. If you change leader yet again, doesn't that Labour Party argument, if anything, get uh, bolsoned? But what, what we have at the moment is government by detail rather than by principle. You get the sense that the government isn't gripping any of the major challenges facing this country. And to have uh, a leader who did, I think, would dramatically improve the Conservative mm. Party chances. And they're losing, um, they're losing the 2019 voters. And here's to your, to your second point, Emily. The appeal of Liz Trust, free market conservatism, is about 8% of the voting public. Um, people vo who voted for Brexit, who constitute the majority of the 2019 uh, electorate, are not in favour of free market policies, largely yeah. because they've lost out from them. The free market, uh, as we practised it since Thatcher and Blur, has shifted wealth to Asia, has improved the condition of the Indian and Chinese working class, if I can call it that, but has exposed the Western working class to insecurity, wage stagnation, and essentially um, deprivation. But some people would argue that, that you know, it's uh, domestic policies that have, have left the cost of living so high. So some of those supply side reforms that Liz Truss wanted in terms of planning regulations and other things fracking. would have made things cheaper. Fracking would have created new jobs, made things cheaper for the everyday person. I agree. I, I agree with uh, some of the points Liz, Liz Truss makes. I rather like her personally. Uh, but the, the point is, is that what the, what the right in the whole of the West has to face, and the Americans have faced this, and they're facing it on the continent, is the free market model immiserates the working class in the West. And we either adjust to that reality or we don't. If it's also provided party, lots of cheap stuff for people in the West. Although, although I think lots, what, what, what Liz Truss might say stuff. to that is she's written this book. It's coming out on the 16th of this month. It says 10 years to save the West. That's the title. And a lot of it is about how we shouldn't have free and unfettered trade with countries like China and only have free trade with countries that share our democratic values. That's one of her big ideas. She calls it an economic NATO. Uh, I suppose that's a, that's a big step change from the uh, paradigm we're living in now. Yeah, I, uh, this reminds me of the tariff reforms that, that we used to have when we were... We, we had an empire where we, wouldn't tr we would ha impose tariffs outside of the empire. I don't disagree with that approach, but that is not a free market approach. It's something like a constrained uh, approach where we link our values with our mm. economic exchange. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that, the, is that for ordinary working people in Britain and in countries like Britain, in Europe and America, the free market has meant wage stagnation, rampant insecurity, and immiseration. Only after 2008, right. it meant it's increased right. wages, right from Margaret Thatcher, right up until the financial crisis. We had, we had some of the fastest growth of any developed economy. Yeah, but it's the distribution of that growth, Tom. That's the point. The All period. levels of income. Yeah, we can continue this discussion, Tom, in a little bit. Well, we're going to yes. have to end this for now. But, Philip, thank you very much indeed. We can have this debate a little bit I just, on. I really like how to... we referenced imperial preference, because it was the 1906 election yes, when yes, the yes. Liberals anyway, we're going routed to the, news headlines. the Tories. We're going to the news headlines. <laughs>very good afternoon. It's just after a half past two. The headlines this half hour. Israel has admitted its forces were behind an unintended airstrike which killed seven aid workers in Gaza, including a British national. The Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, says officials are now checking the incident thoroughly and is pledging to do everything to prevent it happening again. The group killed were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the World Central Kitchen logo. The NGO has claimed the Israel Defence Forces carried out the attack despite coordinating their movements with the military. Those killed also include Palestinians and people from Poland and the US. Rishi Sunak says there must be a transparent investigation. Shocked and saddened to hear the reported deaths of aid workers 
in Gaza. We're urgently working to confirm all the details, but my thoughts right now with their friends and family, they're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered, and it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that, and we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently, because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. A 12-year-old child has been killed and two other children are in a serious condition after a shooting carried out by another child at a primary school in Finland. It's understood the permit for the handgun belonged to a relative of the suspect. Police say the 12-year-old has admitted to carrying out the shooting but that the circumstances are not yet clear. The Finnish Prime Minister says he is deeply shocked and that his thoughts are with the victims and their families. And here in the UK, the Prime Minister is backing J.K. Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. That law came into effect yesterday and rules out hatred against people on certain grounds. But the author says it risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. Rishi Sunak is backing those concerns, saying that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. That's the latest from the GB Newsroom for now. More in the next half hour. You can, in the meantime, sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Welcome along to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. For many, it's a fine-looking day out there today, dry and bright. Many of us seeing some pleasantly warm, sunny spells. But there is some rain in the southwest from this area of low pressure and across the far northeast, northeast of Scotland, under this weather front sink, persistent rain across Aberdeenshire, cold wind blowing across Shetland as well. The breeze picking up in the southwest as the rain creeps in across Devon, Cornwall, parts of Somerset, and just getting into South Wales by the end of the afternoon. Afternoon. One or two showers in southern Scotland, maybe northwest England, but for large parts of England, Wales, Northern Ireland, it's a fine, bright afternoon and quite warm in the sunny spells, 15, 16. Feeling cold though, with that wet weather lingering across uh, the northeast of Scotland. That uh, rain persists through much of the night and further south, the rain will spread north. So most of us will see some wet weather through the course of the night, some heavier bursts likely in parts of North Wales, northwest England. Doing pretty soggy too across the east and south of Northern Ireland. Temperatures mostly holding up in the single figures, 9, 10 degrees the low in parts of the south. But it's a soggy start to Wednesday for Northern England, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Uh, further rain and hill snow to come across the Grampians. Something a little drier in western Scotland and brighter conditions here. And it'll brighten up quite nicely too over the Midlands, South Wales and southern England. Some decent spells of sunshine through tomorrow afternoon, which could see temperatures getting up to 15, 16, maybe 17 Celsius. The latest GB News travel. Good afternoon, I'm Jules Buckley. This queues at the moment northbound for the M90, really slow up towards the Broxton around about Junction 12 for the A9, a lane shut on the roundabout, a multi-vehicle collision causing queues back to Junction 10. Anti-clock M60 from the East Langs Road of 14 to Worsley at 13, slow going, there's a collision. It's now on the hard shoulder but still queuing. A long delays clockwise for the M25 towards Worsley at 10, following the earlier shed load of a concrete slab still causing delays. A northbound M23 delays on the road, Gatwick Airport at 9 up towards the M25 at 8. And the southbound M3 is blocked, lights water at 3 to Camberley at 4, long delays building. There's a lorry fire there currently being attended to this afternoon. And for now, that's your latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel.
Good afternoon, Britain. It's coming up to 20 to 3, and lots and lots of you have been getting in touch with all your views throughout the show. And I think we should start with one that actually rather tickled me um, about the yeah, flag that we had. Not... Right, this is, this is uh, from Steve. He says, I'm no royalist, but I think it's an offence to deface the flag. That's from Steve King. He's no royalist. His yeah, name's King. The tumbleweed. That's, oh. I, just, I just thought it was brilliant. Yeah, um, brilliant, brilliant, yeah. brilliant, 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 brilliant. Um, but lots of people have been writing on the flag. Cathy says, <laughs> show some respect. Many people have fought and died under the Union flag, and that's absolutely true. Yeah, lots of people are, are, are pretty irritated by this all. Linda says, the athletes should not be able to compete if they don't wear the national flag. Simple, she says. Yvonne says, I love the Union Jack. Leave it alone. Sick of these people. Hate it. Stop changing our heritage. Horrible, she Nick says. Nick says, I think the Olympic Great Britain flag is ridiculous, but certainly in keeping with woke ideology. And Nick, I think this is a, I think this is a fair point because everything about the Olympics is always very garish. It's, it's all... Do you yeah. remember the London 2012 logo? It was awful. The London 2012 little alien mascot things. Dreadful. I, 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 I sort of have come to expect this from everything Olympic. It's always just very, very uh, uncomfortable. But as the guy from the uh, Flag Institute said, he said it's different from, you know, playing around with a flag when it's on a piece of merchandise like a mug or a bikini, mm. he said, which was interesting, and, uh, or something else. Um, when it's actually a flag. When it's it meant should to be, be flown as a flag, and, But yes. Richie says, Emily, Tom, please remind Mr Farage about the colour of the Union flag as interpreted by UKIP. It was shades of purple. Yes, it was. That's true. Is there hypocrisy there? No? That was true. No, yeah, different? Is sell, it different? They did sell flags with the sort of UKIP logo in the middle and that were purple, I think. Did they? Yeah, they did. Hmm. Um, so... Is well, there you it, go, a bit of stash, is it, is it a bit of merchandise. Is it but not for me? Um, <laughs> but, of course, we were talking about ID cards as well, and Anne has written in to say, Dear Emily and Tom, regarding your item on identity cards, I still have mine, which were is issued, I think, in the Second World War. I wonder if it would still be valid. Oh, I wish you'd sent in a photo of it. Not. I wish you'd sent in a photo of it, Anne. I'd like to see how, they, how exactly they looked. But I think this is the point that Norman Baker, the former Home Office Minister we had on earlier, w w was making. I mean, are we a papers please society? In the war, of course, people were issued with ID cards. We also had blackouts. We also had sort of uh, the most state impositions on our lives that we saw, well, since the pandemic. Um, but, but is that the society we want to live in all the time? This sort of hand me your papers society? Well, I'm not so, I'm not so sure. Some might say that, um, I would only say to that really, that things are quite dangerous at the moment and we have a big illegal immigration problem. And um, perhaps, as a lot of people have written in to say, they think ID cards would actually help in terms of Other making sure that we know throw their where people over are, the side we know of who the they are. going to keep their ID cards. No, but they wouldn't have an ID card yet, would they? This is once they're here. No, but right? they'll be issued one and they'll throw it away. It's well, gonna... po quite possibly. Quite possibly. Um, but we know that it's not working as it is currently. No, uh, we have also have, of course, been talking about the obesity, as some people say, epidemic. Uh, with regards to how the NHS Addiction. pays for all of this stuff. Um, some people argue people can be addicted to food. I'm not sure people can be addicted to food. I'm not sure that's a... I mean, there, I there are some can. real addictions in life and there are some sort of less real well, addictions. Binge eating, binge eating disorder is a very real one. People can be addicted to losing weight too. I mean, anorexia is a form of addiction, is it not? An mental anore anorexia problem, is, is a mental health condition in and of itself. I wouldn't call that an addiction. Well, I don't know. I think it's a different type of dependency, perhaps. You're mm. not a physical withdrawal, but perhaps some people do experience physical withdrawal uh, when they but, stop consuming um, high-fat foods. Paul has written in with an absolutely terrible idea to solve all of this, one that I heartily disagree with. Paul says we should just put tax on fast food. Why should people who responsibly eat fast food have to pay more just because some people can't eat it responsibly? Do you know what? I really feel like... I can't wait for you to get fat. I'm not going to get fat. Well, you might. I'm not. You might. I just won't. And then you wouldn't be so, you know, judgmental I'm of not people being, who pack on the pounds. I'm not being judgmental. Lots of people pack on the pounds. I'm saying we shouldn't For lots of different food. reasons. For lots of different reasons. Um, no, but you're... I'm not the one saying... You're very I, quick were... to say that it's all about personal responsibility. And yes, of course, to an extent it is. But there are many people who are not lazy, who are not 
you know, hopeless people, but just happen to have a bit of a weight issue. Of course. And, Emily, I'm not the one saying tax the food. Paul's the one saying tax the food. I'm not talking about just taxing I'm food. Arguing Obviously, against I disagree taxing with food. taxing more food. I mean, it's not going to help. Certainly not going to help. The sugar tax hasn't done anything. Um, but, yes, Bob says, mm. obese people die earlier, so therefore cost less in the long term. That's what people say about smokers, too. It's true. So smokers, if actually everyone smoked, uh, people would die earlier, so that would be less Yeah, well, and, and the, the, the biggest, the biggest uh, expenditure on the NHS is in the last five years of people's lives. That's when the most amount of uh, time and, uh, and money goes into the NHS. I mean, it's a, it's a morbid thought. It's and just lastly, thought. on the BBC, on the news that Hugh Edwards is likely to still be the highest paid presenter, despite not presenting the news for eight months. Alan says, if I, as a worker, was suspended, it would undoubtedly be on a reduced salary. This is BBC extravagance. Mm. Well, we don't know what his contract was. No, um, we don't, his... but I would expect that his contract has been written by the very best lawyers, paid for by his enormous salary. Yeah. And so these things are self-perpetuating, aren't they? We've run to the end of the GB View's time, but mm -hmm. I, I really wanted to talk, Emily, about the 1906 election and imperial preference, He's I trying guess. to upset me. I He's trying to upset me. He's trying to oh. upset me. Coming up, we're asking if it's time for the British Museum to return artefacts to foreign countries. That's after this very short break. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Men's mental health, yeah. men are starting to talk a lot more. Yeah. You've been through a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, um, the last few years for me have been very, very difficult. Um, people, don't, people see me on tour, performing, making music, um, but um, myself and my wife, um, you know, we went through... Um, two miscarriages, oh, um, wow. you know, and, you know, for us, that was a very devastating mm. course. time and very difficult to, to, to know how to kind of process those emotions. Mm. And I guess as a man, I, I did the thing of bottling up my emotions and where I feel comfortable to, to be able to express myself is in the studio, whereas, you know, she had obviously a different reaction to, you know, what happened to us because not only was it happening to her mentally, psychologically, but it was happening to her physically as well. And I think what something that she really w would wanted to see from me was that sensitivity and that emotion. And I thought that as a man, being strong was trying to bottle up my emotions and just show her that, no, mm. you know, that I'm, I'm being strong for her. Mm. But actually being strong was is talking about it. Mm. And what's happened ever since I've started to talk about it is I've spoken to more men that have experienced baby loss. My wife forced out of me, you know, how do you feel? And I end up as a mess on the floor. I was exasperating, crying, mm -hmm. almost inconsolable. She was just holding me in her arms um, as we cried together, and we cried together. Um, and I didn't realise I needed that release so badly. Like I said, I've been able to speak to other men, and, and, and we've been able to cry together, and they've, they shared their own experiences, which they did similar to me. But actually, you know, as men, I feel like that conversation and that sensitivity and being able to be mm -hmm. emotional together Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Bye. Oh. 
It's 2.48, hello. Uh, good afternoon, Britain. Now, the Telegraph has revealed the British Museum is holding private discussions with four foreign governments about, guess what, returning items in its collection. Yes, it seems to be the only museum in the world that's really wanting to give things away rather than, you know, collecting things. Um, but the document shows that since 2015, the museum has received 12 separate requests to hand back items. Well, the museum didn't reveal any details about which specific objects or which specific countries were involved, but added the communications were ongoing. Let's speak to the historian and broadcaster Rafe Hadel Munku now, who can join us to talk about this more uh, deeply. Because, Rafe, I, I, I struggle with this subject, because if you think about any museum, anywhere in the world that is collecting objects that didn't originate in that precise spot. Is that bad? Of course it's not bad. I mean, the important point to note here is that the British Museum is what we call an encyclopedic museum, and there, that covers the entire globe. And there are really only three of these in the world, the Louvre in Paris, the Met in New York, and the British Museum. And these institutions actually, because of their global collections, they speak to our shared humanity. They place things like the Elgin marbles and the Benin bronzes within that sort of wider global context where we can chart how civilizations develop differently and at different times. And that used to be understood, but now we are reducing everything to ethnicity and the nation state. And I find it very odd that these increasingly woke curators are essentially prioritizing nationalism over internationalism. Mm. And that seems to be a very odd argument for the left to be making. You know, the left were always usually people who hated nationalism. At least they do when it comes from the West. But when nationalism comes from non-Western countries, suddenly they're greatly great enthusiasts for it. So, Rafe, what should the British Museum's position on all this be? Should they just say no to any claim from any foreign government? Absolutely. Well, the first thing to note, of course, is that this is all happening under the leadership of the most controversial and most powerful chairman of the British Museum in living memory, George Osborne, a man who seems hell-bent on giving away everything that this nation has, firstly opening up us up to the Chinese and having their, their control of critical infrastructure and assets, then being the middleman to facilitate the sale of the Telegraph and the Spectator, two of our most important conservative publications, to an Abu Dhabi-backed company, and now again facilitating these secret negotiations. The fact is what we should be doing is having a permanent exhibition at the British Museum, which celebrates the fact that it was actually Britain and France that saved the world's heritage in those regions. It was Britain and French Orientalists who rediscovered India's classical civilization, who discovered for the world that Buddha came from India, for example, preserved historical artifacts like temples and, and, so, and so forth, which were being completely neglected by the native populations. And it was the British and the French who built the museums that currently stand in those countries where the vast majority of artifacts are actually to be found. The British Museum only has a tiny portion of the items that are actually uh, in collections around the world. The, so we should be celebrating the fact that we've done all of this for, for human civilization, mm. and the British Museum should be thought of as a British Museum of mankind, or a world museum, in other words. Uh, Rafe, the argument goes that, yes, that might well have been true. It might well have been true that had the Elgin marbles stayed uh, on the Parthenon, on the Acropolis in Athens, they would have been blown up by the Ottomans and the gunpowder store as it was. Uh, and, and Britain might well have saved these items. And that's probably true of many of the items in the collection. But that was then and this is now. And many people will argue and do argue that the way to preserve these items, we've, we've done our bit, but now they should return back to their places of origin. Well, that's simply not the case, because there's no guarantee that these items will be well preserved in many of these developing nations. I mean, we don't know the, ac the actual number of uh, countries or which countries are making these requests of the British Museum, but one of those is often quoted is are the Benin bronzes of Nigeria. Uh, these, of course, are uh, the Benin bronzes were commissioned by the most brutal slave-owning regime in Africa, and they commemorate the slave-owning uh, um, slave royals. Now, the Nigerian policy of the Nigerian government is to repatriate all of these Benin bronzes and not put them on public display, but to return them to the descendant, the Oba, the king of the Benin, mm. who was actually a descendant of these slave owners, taking them away from public view. Is that for the, the greater good? Surely the greater good is to have them seen by the largest number of people. And millions more people from around the world will see them in the British Museum. 
then say in Nigeria. Also, what we've known is that when Benin bronzes went back to Nigeria mm -hmm. and other items, within a few years, they often appeared on international sales markets. Well, that's a very good point. Rave, I'm sorry, we're going to have to end it there, but great to speak to you and get your view on all this. Rave Hadel Manku, that's it from us today. It is. That's it. It's been lovely. It's been charming. It's been charming. Yeah, charming as fun. ever. We've had fun. <laughs> um, coming up next, it's Martin Daubney. Martin, what's on your show? Great show, guys. As ever, 60 charities are saying the UK should adopt a Ukrainian-style refugee scheme for Palestinians. What could possibly go wrong? Well, 64% of Palestinians who went to Denmark in the 90s ended up with criminal records. And what about the terrorism links? Also, ID cards. Is it time to bring them back? The Rwanda scheme, we're told, won't work. People will go onto the illegal black market. Is it time for a Blair-style ID scheme to come back? All that coming on the show, three till six. But first, time for your latest weather forecast. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Across some central southern parts, there will be a bit of sunshine tomorrow, but otherwise it's looking pretty wet and there's some rain to come tonight as well. That's because we have an area of low pressure to the southwest of us and that is driving a feature northwards as we go through the rest of today. So ending the day across parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England on a mostly dry note, but rain in the southwest will feed its way across much of England, Wales and into Northern Ireland overnight with some persistent rain continuing across eastern parts of Scotland, bringing a bit of hill snow over the higher ground here. Temperatures not dropping much for many of us because of the unsettled weather, although a touch of frost is possible across the far north of Scotland. Many areas then waking up tomorrow morning to a pretty wet start and staying wet across northern parts with some further, at times, heavy and persistent rain. Further south, though, a drier picture. Yes, there will be a few showers around, but we should also 